subcommittee on energy will now come to order. Uh, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. I want to thank all of our invited guests for being here today to testify at today's hearing entitled Wasted Energy, DOE's Inaction on Efficiency Standards and its Impact on Consumers uh, and the Climate. As we are all well aware, federal efficiency standards conserve energy, separate, create jobs, encourage Americans' ingenuity and innovation, all while helping domestic manufacturers stay competitive in a global uh, economy. The efficiency sector currently employs 2.25 million Americans more jobs than all fossil fuel sectors combined. And there are currently over 315,000 manufacturing workers employed in this sector now, which is an increase of nearly 10% in 2017. Initially, studies have shown that energy efficiency jobs are the fastest growing in the entire energy sector, with an additional 133,000 new jobs created in the year 2017 alone. However, under the Trump administration, DOE has not only failed to publish its legally mandated efficiency standards, but has instead proposed to take the country backwards by recently announcing two uh, proposals that will negatively impact consumers, the public health, employment, and the environment. Full Committee Chairman Pallone, Oversight Subcommittee Chairwoman Negan, and uh, I wrote letters to DOE on two occasions. The first being on November the 1st of last year, and again last month on February 5th, requesting information on these delayed standards and a timeline for when the, event, when the agency expects to take action on these uh, standards. Instead of providing us with direct answers to our straightforward requests, the agency has once again shown what I consider to be contempt for the role of Congress by directing us to hyper, uh, hyperlink that could be found on the uh, Google search engine. Let me be crystal clear. DOE's failure to update the 16 appliance and equipment standards that were adopted and finalized during the Obama administration violates its statutory obligations under the Energy Power and Conservation Act. What's more, this failure to publish new standards will disproportionately harm low-income Americans who are more likely to be renters and therefore will save money on monthly utility bills when outdated appliances are replaced with more efficient ones. This failure to follow the law, which was enacted on a bipartisan basis under President George W. Bush could potentially cost consumers billions of dollars in energy bills while also creating uncertainty for domestic 
manufactured. Yet instead of working on this lingering mandated responsibility, just last month, DOE announced a new proposal to narrow the scope of energy efficiency standards for light bulbs, which set higher, higher efficiency levels for three billion sockets in American homes. Uh, DOE fa failure to follow its congressional mandate, along with its short-sighted proposals, will slow down progress and compromise the highly successful standards program that has helped save the average family over $500 annually off their energy bills. So I look forward to, to today's hearing, and I look forward to hearing from DOE, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of our witnesses. With that, I want to yield now to my good friend, uh, the ranking member from the, the great state of Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing to continue our oversight of DOE's successful appliance and equipment standards program. I look forward to hearing from Assistant Secretary Simons, who leads the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, which carries out this important program. In addition to energy efficiency standards, EERE has an important responsibility to manage and invest billions of dollars in cutting edge research and development to encourage innovation and drive the transition to a clean energy economy. And while this is not a budget hearing that's gonna take place in May, as I understand, there have been leaked reports about EERE's FY20 budget proposal, uh, which I'm not gonna comment on. But I do wanna state for the record that we expect EERE to carry out the law as Congress intended and utilize the resources that Congress provides. Since the mid-80s, DOE has established successive rounds of efficiency standards for a wide variety of household and industrial products, such as air conditioners, refrigerators, washing machines, clothes dryers, furnaces, ovens, dishwashers, dishwashers water heaters, and light bulbs. I believe DOE's efficiency standards have served as one of the nation's most effective policies for reducing energy use. Efficiency standards have also contributed greatly towards reducing our carbon emissions and environmental impacts, strengthening our energy security for sure, and providing consumers with significant cost savings. If we're gonna have a serious solution-oriented discussion about how to address climate change risks, as I believe that we should, then we must acknowledge the historical progress that we've made with DOE's efficiency program. We also must recognize the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead and remove regulatory barriers to new technological innovations and efficiency gains. The Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 75, known as EPCA, established the first energy efficiency program, consisting of consumer product testing procedures, labeling, and energy efficiency targets. Over the last number of years, Congress amended EPCA and passed new laws setting prescriptive standards for certain products and directing DOE to establish new standards via rulemaking for other categories of products. For home appliances, Congress requires DOE to conduct a six-year look back where DOE must publish a new standard or publish a determination that one is not necessary. Congress also requires DOE to maintain a multi-year schedule to regularly review and update all standards and test procedures. It's long past time that Congress re-examine re EPCA to see if there are ways to modernize the 40-year-old statute to improve DOE's appliance standards program. So while DOE seems to be doing what it can administratively with the long-awaited update to its process rule for standard settings, it is up to Congress to review the law and make changes when appropriate. With that, I look forward to the hearing today and I yield back the, my balance of my time to Mr. Latta. Well, I thank the uh, gentleman for yielding, and I also want to thank our witnesses for being with us today. My district in northwest, west central Ohio has over 60,000 manufacturing jobs where many of the products covered by the program are made. I hear consistently that manufacturers are not against regulations, but they want and need common sense regulations that provide certainty to help them plan for their businesses. 
Last Congress, I worked on draft legislation regarding updating and modernizing EPCA, and I am pleased to see the work the Department of Energy has undertaken with the process improvement rule, and I believe we need to explore these changes and see what needs to be done in statute. I believe that energy efficiency is a bipartisan issue, and we should be able to work together in this committee to ensure that DOE is able to put its resources toward the products and categories that will lead to the largest energy savings. This is what consumers expect from us, and giving DOE the tools to meet deadlines, provide more certainty to manufacturers, and therefore increase innovation and competition to benefit consumers should be our goal. I recently toured a new state-of-the-art innovation center in my district. Additionally, we have seen product line expansions in other facilities across my district. These companies have seen that investing in Ohio is a win for their companies and the communities. Certainty for businesses like this one only encourage more investment and innovation, and that is why I want to work with my colleagues on this program. I look forward to hearing from DOE and our second panel today about what DOE is doing and what Congress needs to do to continue to strengthen energy efficiency programs. And I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, who is the chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we're here to find out why the Department of Energy is dragging its feet in implementing energy efficiency standards that will save consumers money and help combat climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For years, promoting energy efficiency was a bipartisan issue. During the Obama administration, DOE finalized 50 new product efficiency standards. Many of these new standards stem from energy bills that this committee passed on a bipartisan basis and were then signed into law by President Bush in 2005 and 2007. And in fact, our ranking member, uh, Mr. Upton played a leading role in that 2007 effort, and we're all benefiting as a result of that bipartisan work. Sadly, the progress on this important program came to a grinding halt when President Trump was inaugurated. Since then, DOE has made a conscious choice to ignore the law by refusing to finalize or update efficiency standards for 16 products, including refrigerators, washing machines, and room air conditioners. Even more egregious, the Trump administration refuses to publish in the Federal Register four efficiency standards finalized in December 2016. These standards were complete and awaiting official publication, but DOE refused to follow the law and follow through. And then last month, DOE announced that it was completely dis discarding a significant update to light bulb efficiency standards finalized in January 2017. Those standards expanded existing light bulb efficiency guidelines to include a broader range of light bulb sizes, such as candelabra and cone-shaped bulbs. Trashing this significant standard will allow inefficient products to remain on the market and increase consumers' electricity bills. DOE also released a revised process rule, which guides how DOE sets appliance efficiency standards. The new rule makes it harder to update efficiency standards. It does this by cooking the economic analysis for new standards so the costs are taken into greater account while narrowing the scope of benefits that DOA will consider. It also allows manufacturers to use their own test procedures to verify a product's energy usage. That's a terrible idea. We should have learned something from the Volkswagen emission test cheating scandal. Even worse, it's clear from publicly available documents that political staff at the Office of Management and Budget intervened to make it nearly impossible for DOE to deviate from this new process, even when sticking to the process would conflict with legal mandates. But most egregious is the fact that this administration spent the last two years writing proposals that weaken efficiency standards while completely disregarding the law's mandate to update or finalize efficiency standards for 16 products. While I may have issues with this new process rule, I don't have a problem with trying to make the process more efficient. But when the law says you need to take a specific action, the department's job is to carry out the law and not go off and do whatever it wants. And I hope that's something all members of this committee can agree on. Today, all of us who care about the issue of climate change have a chance to condemn DOE's delays. National energy efficiency standards for appliances are one of the most cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and the program has resulted in 3 billion tons of avoided emissions since its inception. Every day, the administration delays updating efficiency standards for these common household products. Consumers' electricity bills remain higher than necessary, 
and more electricity is unnecessarily generated to power these less efficient appliances. And these delays must come to an end. So, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say I know that a lot of times when we, t we have he hearings on uh, or we talk about energy e efficiency, you know, people say, well, you know, how important is that? Uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything really right now that's more important than has the potential of getting bipartisan support or, or really has had bipartisan support uh, for a long time that would actually reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So when we talk about climate change, um, you know, this is one of the most important things that we can address, and, and there's no reason really why the Trump administration should be, you know, turning the clock on this, even if they don't believe uh, in climate change. Uh, what's the downside, if you will, of having more efficiency, uh, saving money, reducing costs, and, 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 uh, and reducing uh, greenhouse emissions? Thank you. I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, for the purposes uh, of an opening statement. Mr. Walden has five minutes. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing to continue our oversight over the Department of Energy's Appliance and Equipment Standards Program. I want to extend a warm welcome to Assistant Secretary Dan Simmons, who leads DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Dan, we're glad to have you here and glad to know you're you're finally in place. I guess that all took effect officially in January, sworn in. So we appreciate your leadership at EERE. Republicans are focused on solutions that save energy, help the environment, save consumers money. So we too welcome the opportunity to explore ways to strengthen and improve this important Department of Energy program. Since the early 1980s, the Department of Energy has issued minimum energy efficiency standards for a wide variety of residential and commercial products, including air conditioners, refrigerators, washers and dryers, ovens, dishwashers, lighting, and other products that Americans use every day. The Department's authority to regulate energy efficiency in commercial equipment and residential appliances is derived from the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, also known as EPCA. While Congress has passed a few updates to this 44-year-old statute. We learned through our oversight hearings in the last few Congresses that more could be done to modernize the law and to improve the process to formulate national energy efficiency standards. Under the Obama administration and under the Trump administration, Department of Energy has missed statutory deadlines for efficiency rulemakings. Both administrations have. These delays create uncertainty and they've led to unnecessary litigation, which makes matters even worse. DOE is doing what it can to fix the process administratively. Under the Trump administration, DOE has completed more than a dozen rulemakings addressing conservation standards and test procedures for products such as external power supplies, light bulbs, ceiling fans, walk-in coolers and freezers, air conditioners, and pool pumps. Just last month, DOE announced two new proposals. The first would revise the definitions of general service lamps to align with the definitions established by Congress in 2007. DOE was forced to take this action in response to a lawsuit and subsequent Department of Justice settlement agreement reached in 2017. While some have described this action as a rollback, that is a mischaracterization. DOE has appropriately committed to undertake a separate rulemaking as Congress intended for certain specialty light bulbs, such as those used in heavy machinery and marine applications. The second proposal announced in February would take long overdue steps to reform the regulatory process that DOE relies upon to develop efficiency standards. The Department of Energy's new proposal, an update to the process rule, would substantially improve the process for setting efficiency standards and test procedures. The proposed rule to the process rule would enhance transparency, accountability, and regulatory certainty for manufacturers and for consumers alike. While it's hard to believe this is the first update to the process rule in more than 20 years. One of the most important things the process rule would do is to define what qualifies as significant energy savings. That seems pretty important to do. This will enable the department to better prioritize rulemakings to save energy and put more money back in consumers' product, uh, pockets. Under EPCA, there is not a lot of flexibility, which too often has led to unnecessary deadlines and rush sue and settle regulations that fall short of providing customers the better quality products that use less energy. We know that unless we amend EPCA, the regulatory backlog will continue as it has under multiple uh, presidential administrations. So it's up to us, the Congress, to fix this mess 
We're ready to work with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to do so. Over the last couple of years, Republican members of this subcommittee have been working across the aisle and engaging in a wide range of stakeholders uh, meetings to identify bipartisan solutions to modernize EPCA. We've made some progress, but there's still plenty to do. So if the Democrats are willing to work with us, we're willing to work with you. And we welcome the opportunity to work with you to continue this effort, this Congress. And again, Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding this hearing. It's really important. And I yield back the balance of my time. I want to thank the gentleman. Uh, gentleman yields back. The chair would like to remind members, of, members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. And I would like now to introduce our witness for the first panel of today's hearing, Mr. Daniel Simmons. Uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Simmons, uh, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of, uh, of Energy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome to uh, this subcommittee hearing, and uh, would like you to, uh, you have five minutes for an opening statement. And before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system to you. You might be familiar with it, but it's written here, and let me uh, adhere to my script. Uh, in front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. And we want to thank you again for joining us today, and we all look forward to your testimony. And you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Uh, <clears throat> Ranking Member Upton, Ranking Member uh, Walden, uh, as well as uh, Chairman Pallone, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, for the Department of Energy to appear before the committee today and to discuss the Appliance Standards Program and ways in which the department is working to improve the process for developing energy conservation standards. The program within DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy implements minimum energy conservation standards for more than 70 uh, categories of labor-saving appliances and equipment and has far-reaching impacts on American consumers and businesses. As EERE Assistant Secretary, I am responsible for overseeing a broad portfolio of energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. And one of my top priorities is energy affordability. Affordable, reliable energy is critical to human well-being. When uh, energy is more for affordable, it frees up more of our budget and time so we can spend these precious resources on the things we care about most. Affordable energy is one of the things that makes the EERE portfolio so important. We have seen multiple successes through EERE technologies over the past 10 years, including dramatic reductions in the price of photovoltaic solar, offshore, uh, onshore wind, electric vehicle battery packs, and LED lights. Technological innovation is, is the driving force behind these successes. In addition to its significant research and, uh, research and development responsibilities, EERE is also responsible for a large regulatory portfolio, the vast majority of which is implemented, uh, which implements state <clears throat> energy conservation standards for appliances and equipment. Since January 20, uh, uh, 2017, DOE has, it, has issued seven final rules pertaining to energy conservation standards, two final rules pertaining to test procedures on the, under the appliance standards uh, program, as reported in the fall 2018 unified agenda of regulatory and deregulatory actions, EERE plans to take action on 24 test procedures and 17 energy conservation standards in the coming months. There was uh, a proposed uh, test procedure that we announced yesterday. There will be another one, uh, if not tomorrow, early next week. Uh, so we are, we are making progress. Since the passage of the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, DOE has used a process for considering, a new, uh, considering new and amended energy conservation standards to ensure that they meet our statutory requirements. That process, which was first formalized in 1996 in DOE's so-called process rule, 
typically takes a minim minimum of three years to complete and consists of four phases, each with an opportunity for the public to provide input. First, DOE publish a publishes a framework document presenting the analytical, procedural, and legal principles that will guide the rulemaking. In the second phase, DOE conducts and publishes a preliminary access assessment of available technical, economic, and market data about the product. During the third phase, DOE publishes a proposed rule in which DOE proposes an efficiency level that it is determined will result in the maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is both technically, uh, technologically feasible and economically justified and would save a significant amount of energy. The fourth phase is the final rule in which DOE considers public input uh, in response to the proposed rule, further revises the analysis if, if appropriate and issues the final rule. We have had great success administering the program and we believe that DOE can further improve the process by which it develops standards uh, to make the program even more effective. This is why we recently proposed to amend the process to enhance early engagement opportunities for stakeholders and increase certainty throughout our rulemaking process. These improvements will reduce the burden of the process by which standards are developed, preserve, preserve product choice for consumers, and prioritize those standards that are expected to save consumers and businesses the greatest amount of energy. In addition, and importantly, these process measures can improve DOE's ability to comply with statutory deadlines that the program has a difficulty meeting throughout its history by focusing 100% of our efforts on the rules that have accounted for nearly 100% of the historical energy savings. In addition to the process rule, DOE has also published a proposed rule to maintain the existing statutory definition for general service lamps and withdraw the definitions established in January 2017. Through this proposal, DOE is showing that it will follow the text of the law, maintaining the statutory definitions uh, provides manufacturers with regulatory certainty that they will not be prohibited from selling hundreds of millions of light bulbs. At the same time, DOE will continue to advance cutting edge research and development of next generation lighting technology to further uh, drive uh, improvements in efficiency and affordability. Um, as, uh, as Ranking Member Upton mentioned, there was, a, uh, there was an article this morning about EERE's budget. Obviously, I cannot comment on uh, the budget before it has been released. However, I'm more than happy to talk about um, how we are executing the monies that have been appropriated for um, FY 2019. In the last week, we have announced two uh, funding opportunity announcements, one on hydrogen um, and the exciting technologies there, and another one on efficiency improvements on medium and heavy duty trucks. So there's a lot going on and you will see more in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but I obviously can't comment on a budget that has not been released. DOE is committed to working with Congress as it considers these and others important issues of DOE's appliance standards program. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today to discuss uh, these important energy, efficient, energy efficiency issues, and I look forward to your questions. I want to thank uh, the Assistant Secretary, and we have now uh, concluded the opening statements. Uh, we will now move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Assistant Secretary Simmons is very, very disturbing to me that DOE under the current administration has invested so much valuable time in working on two new proposals that are both unnecessary and would actually harm consumers. Yet at the same time, it has spent little to no time in publishing the legally mandated efficiency standards and that uh, it should have been working on. Uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, is it your interpretation that DOE has the discretion to choose when or if it must follow congressionally mandated laws and obligations? No, we, we must follow the, the, the text of the 
uh, of the law. Well, what is the reason for this, these delays in publishing uh, these mandates that are uh, congressionally directed to the department? So the, the, the law requires, the law sets out certain deadlines. The, uh, the law also requires uh, for, um, for setting standards, what we need to determine is the maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is both technically, technologically feasible and economically justified. And there are seven different factors that go into deciding whether something is economically justified. That process can take a decent amount of time to consider what is a maximum achievable, what is a maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is, that is, that is possible, what is technologically feasible. That process can take uh, literally years um, to consider, especially because there, we are not allowed to uh, to reduce the, uh, the the performance characteristics of of products, um, so the process can take a long time to go through, and it's important that we do a good job following the process to make sure the substance of the rules. The, like, Mr. Secretary, yes. then, was this process that you are currently discussing wasn't this finalized during the last administration, the, and all all that remains? Uh, of you uh, and uh, the department today is to publish uh, these standards? Uh, the, if, if, if you're talking about the, 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 four, um, the four rules that are currently in litigation that were, th that were not finalized by the department by sending them to the Federal Register, um, those are currently in litigation and, and uh, because they're in litigation, I can't discuss those, right. those rules. Well, what about the other 12 rules that are not in litigation? Uh, those rules are, uh, are, are currently moving forward. We have, um, as, as you said, we have a statutory obligation. We have a legal obligation to complete those rules, and we are working on those rules. If those rules were ready to go, we would be sending them to the Federal Register, but there are no rules that... Mr. Uh, all right, Mr. Secretary, we know that a typical household saves about $500 per year because of the current standards, making energy conservation standards the most effective tool the only has for making energy more affordable for the average American. Additionally, the cost of LED lights uh, has increased significantly over the past 10 years. You have even stated publicly that these bulbs have dropped over 90% uh, over the past decade. According to the Appliance Standards Awareness Project, this proposed light bulb rollback will cost the average American household an extra $100 a year, and overall, consumers will be forced to pay an additional $12 million between now and 2025 on electric bills. So my question to you is, why are you rolling back the light bulb standards? What is the reason or justification for uh, this action on your part? And who exactly are you trying to help by uh, this proposed rollback? Uh to, to clarify, we are not rolling back a, a standard. We are defining what is a general service lamp by using the by the by using the text of the statute. We are following the law about what is a general service lamp. Um, that is a change in uh, in in definition from what was uh, previously um, uh, from what was uh, uh, previously put in place, uh, but. This was a. This is. It is critical for us to follow the law, including for things that uh, that may result in energy savings. One of the things that I will note is that uh, this. I am very skeptical of large amounts of of harm to the American people because they have uh, greater selection of light bulbs available to them. This uh, this definition does not take any light bulbs off the table, and if you go to Home Depot today, you will see. For example, you will see where the lighting industry is headed and that, that future is LED lights. Um, 
Just the other day, I bought some of the lights that are not required, would not be required to be LEDs. I bought them as LEDs when I was at, at Home Depot. The future is LED. The future is greater energy conservation in, in light. My, my time is up. Uh, the chair will now recognize Mr. Upton uh, for five minutes to ask questions. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman, again. Uh, I've long been a supporter of DOE's work on appliance standards, but I know I realize we have to be realistic about the challenges and I know that you've got a good number of delayed rulemakings that's built up over a number of different administrations. And I just want to go back to a comment that I made in my opening statement about the process rule. Uh, this is the look back. Uh, um, right, I get, uh, why is it so important to update that process rule and how will some of the changes such as defining significant energy savings help prioritize in that effort? Well, I, I think the most important thing for DOE to do is to follow the process rule. When the Clinton administration in 1996 put the process rule in place, it is a overall a good rule. And what is critical is that we follow all the steps, as in that we have a test procedure and that test procedure is finalized to know how we're measuring energy, energy before we discuss how much energy an appliance can use, because you can't that, that, that just can result in disconnects, and that has not always happened. So what we really wanted to stress, first and foremost, is to follow the process that was outlined in 1996. Second, the best way that we achieve substantive um, good rules, good rules substantively, is to make sure that there is robust stakeholder engagement, robust public engagement, and the best way we do that is by um, going, through the, going through the process that can take time, as we have, have seen. And how is the look back requirement uh, hampered your ability to comply with the statutory deadlines, the, the six-year look back? Well, one of, one of the challenges is, is that we get, um, there, there are some circumstances um, where uh, a rule, a, a compliance date, we, we have a compliance date, and then we have to start looking at the new rule just, uh, at a new rule just after that. One of those, um, one example is with uh, closed dryers. In, uh, there was a compliance date of January 2015, but then uh, the program started to look in March of that same year at regulating the, pro uh, the, pro the product again. And that's, uh, that sort of thing has also happened with com uh, commercial clothes washers, where work started on a new rule even before the previous rule was, um, uh, Final even line. before the compliance date. So would it be better, as we try and address this or, or think about the future, would it be better to have it maybe a six year after the rule is, is finalized and actually the product in, in use at that point? Uh, there is a, there, there's definitely an argument to be made that after the compliance, that it could be after the compliance date. To, because the, the challenge is, is that we have to look what is out on the market. We have to look at the art of the possible. Um, and uh, that is difficult to do when you, uh, when you have a compliance date, and then we, we start a couple months later looking at uh, revising the standard. Uh, last question I have, and we're going to talk a little bit about this on the second panel. So DOE has been sued, we know, by efficiency advocates and product manufacturers over missed deadlines. What are you doing to improve the transparency in the rulemaking process so that consumers can be confident that the new products that they're purchasing meet that expectation for quality, convenience, and obviously for energy efficiency. Uh, well, the biggest thing we are doing is following the process and moving stepwise through the, through the process. Uh, making sure that, that we are uh, conducting a process that is, op that is overall open and transparent and that there is stakeholder engagement, there's plenty of time for public comment um, because that the, the public comment is, is critical to making sure that we get rules that are in the end um, substantively um, beneficial. And is there fairly um, universal agreement that when you go to an appliance store, whether it be Best Buy or someplace else, that in fact the labels uh, on those appliances, whether they be air conditioners or freezers or whatever it is, are sufficient for the consumer in terms of what their energy savings is going to be? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Have you heard any complaints? I mean, I, it, it seems like the labeling is uh, pretty apparent. Uh, the, the labeling is is very apparent with the energy guard guide standard that uh, the um, federal uh, federal trade commission um, puts on them using our data um, is that sufficient i don't know that's a that's a really good question okay uh, mr chairman i yield back thank you 
chair now recognizes Mr. Peters of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Assistant Secretary for uh, coming before the committee. Um, many of the policies under your portfolio are debated here in D.C. I think there's a widespread recognition that energy efficiency is, is something that, um, that can be a bipartisan issue. Uh, in, uh, in California, with the buying power of nearly 40 million people, um, uh, our, ener our energy efficiency goals support the notion we could do much more at a federal le level. You know, in these, in these meetings, um, uh, we sometimes get caught up in the, in the law that exists and how to administer it. I, I would just want to take a minute to ask you if there's, if there's ways you think that the Congress could help support um, more energy efficiency, either by um, enacting new, new legislation or by fixing legislation that you're having to deal with. Are there things that you're seeing that we could be doing better to promote energy efficiency? Well, when it, when it would come to uh, legislative changes, that would, that would need to go through the appropriate process, which unfortunately wouldn't just be me today. One of, but one of the things that I would like to stress is um, Congress provides robust funding to the, uh, to the Building Technology Office, which does research and development on uh, looking at new building technologies, um, such as uh, solid state heating and cooling for next generation appliances, um, uh, we will be um, announcing the funding opportunity uh, for, from the Building Technology Office for a number of different topics in the next few weeks. And so there, uh, there, there, is, there is regulatory angle, but the, then there's also the R&D angle. And I, I, I think it's Im important that we consider both. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have any uh, statutory uh, changes, but um, be happy to go back to the department and to, to work on some ideas. Well, uh, the reason I'm asking you is that, you know, this is the process for, for finding out if we need to make legislative changes. You're in a position to observe kind of how the administrative rules that have been set up by prior Congresses and rulemaking are, are working. So I, I just want to give you the opportunity, if you see anything that you think needs to be improved or that in any way in which you're restricted from doing what would best serve energy efficiency, I want to give you that chance. And if you don't have that today, that's fine, but I, I, I think this is the right place to do it if, if you have those, those uh, suggestions for us. And uh, I, I will I will be happy to uh, to try to provide some some comments um, in the questions for the record on okay. that. Um, that would I appreciate. You th I mean, sort of a left field question, maybe, but uh, but I would appreciate you think any thoughts on that would be helpful to us. Sure thing. I also want to reiterate what Mr. Upton said is that the integrity of the um, of the labeling and the measurements for appliances is going to be very important. There's there's some discussion of whether we should uh, have market incentives that would um, encourage consumers on their own to make purchases um, with, uh, with energy savings in mind, uh, sort of a, if a carbon tax would be an appropriate um, price signal to send through the economy. But if they don't have the right information about those appliances, uh, that's going to be a very, um, it's not going to be as efficient as theoretically um, people think of it, it would be. So um, again, I think I appreciate uh, working with you to make sure that, that those labels are correct and that your information is, is relied on. It's by the FDC, I guess, is that right? Yes, yes. And uh, I know, that, I mean, I use those labels when I look at, uh, when, when I look at new products and I'm doing, um, you know, figuring out what to, what to put in our house. Uh, I, I hope they're accurate. I haven't heard that they're not, um, but th it's definitely an area where there could be research. Another, um, another part uh, is uh, with uh, Energy Star labeling program to label the products that are the most energy efficient. Um, we work on that with, the, with, the, with EPA. Right. Um, and that, that, uh, that, that labeling has very high adoption and is, is very much uh, uh, appreciated by consumers. Since you brought it up, I mean, you're, you don't directly administer it, but do you have comments on the Energy Star program? Do you have a... Well, we, we, we jointly administer it with EPA. Um, don't, I, I, I don't have any comments on the... Um, on Energy Star today, but. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member on the full committee, uh, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, to our witness, thank you, Mr. Simmons, for being here. And I want to follow up on what our colleague from uh, Southern California was talking about, because I, I think it's important for both sides of the aisle. Uh, Congress bears some responsibility here. We write the laws that, that you get to administer, and sometimes we don't always get it right. 
And over the last few years, the committee's conducted some pretty rigorous oversight, and we've received testimony that highlights the importance of EPCA modernization. So I, I would just pose it this way. I, I understand you can't take positions on legislation initially sitting there right today. But will you commit to working with the committee by providing your comments and technical assistance as we work to modernize this law? Yes, definitely. So I think that would be really helpful. You've got the technical people and we're gonna write the law and we both wanna get it right for consumers. And I, I've got a couple of questions like you when I buy new appliances for my home. Um, I look at those ratings, they help, they're helpful. And I think the more we can empower consumers to make the right choices to save energy, uh, reduce emissions and cut costs uh, is a good thing uh, for the country and for the world. And, and I, I just have a couple of questions since I have you here about how all that works. Um, when you're doing this analysis on, on various appliances, whether it's a water heater or a washer or dryer, or an air conditioner, is that based on more than one sort of temperate zone? I mean, is it all based out of savings in Arizona or savings in Michigan or, I mean, how does that work? I mean, I know it's an average, I get that, but you know, our power costs in the Northwest, thankfully are a little lower than some parts of the country, um, but our climate's different too. So as a consumer, what should I know about that labeling? About, well, that, uh, with the labeling, I think it can be kind of kind of difficult because the um, on like uh, the energy guide label, right. I believe it is the uh, average electricity rates in the entire country. Since you're from Oregon, Oregon has a lot of hydro and has some of the lowest electricity rates in the country. So those numbers are kind of high for and lower for, emission rates too. Just to stipulate <laughs> the record, <laughs> uh, correct. And so. That is a, that, that's a challenge with those kind of labels yeah. in a place like Oregon, that they're going to over-represent the amount of uh, electricity, for example, that people, would, uh, th th that people would say because it's a national average. Um, there are, uh, for various products such as, uh, such as furnaces, that we do look at uh, performance in different uh, zones of the country because a furnace that is uh, for, the, for the Northeast um, doesn't necessarily need to be as efficient because it, it uh, well, it needs to be more efficient, I should say, than a furnace that is in Atlanta, for example. Right, where it wouldn't where, be used. Where you might not much. have to use it very many hours out right. of the year, and so the, the payback is different. So we do consider yeah. different climate zones. I believe uh, some of the analysis that we do have seven different climate zones, if I'm um, not mistaken. Okay. So it is... Uh, it, and is that reflected on the labels then? That's not reflected on the, on the, like the energy guide label, I do not believe. So as a consumer, how would I know then uh, the differences that may occur in these seven zones if it's seven? That is, uh, well, some, some products may not be available in your, in your area, for example, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure of how, we, uh, how a consumer would know um, which, which zone they're in and as well as what right. the energy prices are in, in yeah. their part of the country. You would think with today's information age technology, you could have a code that you could scan and it would link to a database or something and give you more realistic data. I, I'll probably get myself in real trouble here, but when I shop for a car and look at the miles per gallon that EPA says that car is gonna get, I've yet to have had that actually work out that way. Um, and so I think for as a consumer, I want labels I can trust and data that I know I can factor in to my equations. And so that'd be something I'd, I'd love to work with you on. Um, okay. I, we want it to be practical too, I get that. But the well, cost of energy is really important and I know the Green New Deal was just evaluated to drive up electricity costs by 22%. So if, if they're gonna march forward with that proposal, it's gonna become even more important that we look for ways to save energy uh, every, everywhere we can if they're gonna drive up energy costs 22% for American consumers. That seems like a pretty big hike in, in energy costs. And So with that, Mr. Chairman, I um, appreciate the hearing, and, and Mr. Simmons, thanks for willing to take on this task, and we look forward to working with you in a, in a bipartisan way on uh, technical assistance as we work to improve this program. It's really important to consumers. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the ranking member. Now, the chair now recognizes the chairman of the full uh, committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Rush. In the last two years, the department has blown through 16 legally mandated deadlines to finalize standards for appliances. Instead of updating these standards, DOE has spent this time crafting a draft rule to get rid of efficiency standards for light bulbs that are projected to save the average household $100 per year on its electricity bill in 2025. Now, I sent a, a thorough letter to Secretary Perry in November of last year asking for, among other items, documents related to the department's schedule for action on appliance standards rulemakings that are overdue. And what I received in response, and I actually have a copy of it here, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll ask that we uh, unanimous consent to put it in the record. Uh, this was the response. It was a three-line letter that said, quote, attached is a list of hyperlinks, and that was followed by five pages of links to different portions of the DOE website. Uh, I think, honestly, uh, Sir, this ranks up there as one of the most disrespectful and uncooperative letters I've ever received from a federal agency. And I then resent the letter last month, and while the response this time around was more accommodating, it still left many questions unanswered. So one of the items that DOE provided was the December 2018 uh, report to Congress, that's this document, uh, that contains, in my opinion, no useful information about what actions DOE has taken on these 16 products. It simply states, and I quote, in development for many of them. And frankly, unless I'm shown otherwise, I, I'm going to assume that in development means that the department hasn't done anything. So my questions, uh, Mr. Secretary uh, uh, Simmons, will you commit to finishing these standards that the DOE is legally mandated to update? I'm just looking for a yes or no. Will you commit to finishing these standards yes. that are legally mandated? Yes. Okay. Will you finish them in six months? Uh, probably not. Uh, how about by the end of the year? Some will be, some are, are possible, that, but it is, it, it is important that we meet our, our legal deadlines, but it's also important that we meet the substantive requirements of EPCA. Well, and look, I, I want to say... substantive requirements. I know, I understand, but, you know, it's just, you know, it just seems to me you're not going to follow the law. The law says that you have deadlines. You know, if you had said six months, I said, okay. And then I say at the end of the year, you say, I don't know, I'm, you know, maybe. I, I, to me, that, that needs is a clear indication that there's not a serious effort here. And I, I think that we really need to see some action now uh, to update and finalize these critical efficiency standards because they save consumers money and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Let, let me go to, I, only, I have one more question, Mr. Simmons, um, and I'm gonna shift gears to quote from a letter for the record we received for today's hearing, uh, which I would ask to be included in the record uh, I'd ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman. This is from Alexander Karsher, who is the assist, assistant, was the assistant secretary for renewable energy uh, under President Bush. Uh, here, here, no objections. Uh, let so me, wanna... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just quote from this, and then I'm going to ask you a question, Mr. Simmons. I want, this is a quote from that letter. I want to affirm to all the members of the subcommittee today that there is no basis in science, technology, policy, or economics for these new proposals from the administration to roll back progress or to undermine bipartisan lighting standards. The administration's proposals are measurably harmful to consumers, to markets, and to the environment. Further, there's no reason for the department to continue missing statutory deadlines to promulgate new efficiency standards and remain in compliance with the will of Congress. These hurdles have been overcome already, and the failure to continue progress simply reflects a lack of acumen, denying the benefits of innovation for the many in favor of the profits of the few. Now, as I said, this is not from a national environmental group or a major consumer nonprofit. It's a letter from Alexander Carson, who was Assistant Secretary from 2006 to 2008 during the George Bush administration. Basically, in, in, you know, Mr. Kashner held your job under President Bush, and he finds it hard to understand why DOE has missed so many standards. Do you have any response to that comment by Mr. Karstner, Mr. Simmons? Sure, I, I don't know that he's read the law. Okay. Um, well. as, in, as in, we took this action because it most closely conforms with the statute it most closely conforms with the text of EPCA. That's the reason that we did it. You can make all the other arguments, but we need to do this because it is the most legally um, 
well, supportable. I think it's pretty sad. Quite frankly, the record of the Appliance and Equipment Standards Program under the Trump administration is dismal. And I think it's time for the department to step up to the plate and begin acting on these standards. It doesn't seem like you will, but hopefully you will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair, one thing, the, uh, the full committee chairman, the chair now recognizes Mr. Atlanta of Ohio for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. S Assistant Secretary, thanks very much for being with us today. And uh, my first question is, why is it important to establish a threshold for significant energy savings? Sure. Uh, we did an analysis, and we looked at uh, the rules that we've done in the past and how much energy savings there's been for, for those rules. And what it turns out is that there are 60% of the rules that we did resulted in 96% of the overall energy savings. What that means, if you look at it, uh, on the, on the flip side is that we spent 40% of our time and only uh, on rules that where we only saved 4% of energy savings overall. So we had, that is a, that's an issue. What, what, what the difference is, is that on rules where you save over uh, 0.5 quads over 30 years, that's uh, rules where you save over 0.5 quads over 30 years, those are the 60% of rules that re resulted in 96% of savings. So what we want to do is to make sure that we are saving over 0.5 quads in a rule because those are the rules where there's the most bang for, for our, our, our buck, the most, uh, the most energy savings for the time that we spend on it. And so it's critical to, to focus our efforts there um, because that, I believe, will it'll help us meet our regulatory deadlines as well as making sure that we have rules that are substantively defensible. Thank you. Uh, one of our witnesses in the next panel specifically mentioned the uh, example of DOE's proposed standard for dishwashers and how the standard was such that dishwashers could no longer get the job done. It's a good example of something I'd like to make sure DOE was taking into consideration. How will DOE ensure that a proposed standard does not and will not negatively impact a product's performance? So this is a, uh, this is a very important issue because we are, we are forbidden by statute um, for, uh, to impose a standard that would decrease performance. However, there are some times or, or reduced product features. However, uh, there are some examples where uh, reasonable people could disagree. Uh, one of the things, for example, um, where we have found is a, is a feature is on, a, on a, an oven, whether or not there is a window, we found that that is a, that is a feature, but uh, people disagree, can and have disagreed over things such as uh, whether the venting for a, a water heater, is that venting a, a, a performance feature or not? Uh, so this is a, an important area for us to look at. It's important areas for us to ask questions of the public, of stakeholders, uh, to find, um, to make sure that we have rules for to make sure that products are doing a good job of saving people's time, because uh, people's time is an important. Well, you know, important because resource. I think it's important because again, let's just say uh, from a, from a dishwasher or a washing machine or something else or a dryer, that uh, someone finds that it you know they have to keep pressing the button to get something done. So actually, what you're in the end run, you're losing more energy because you have to keep using that product, the, the appliance, over and over and over. So. I think it's really important that DOA uh, takes that into consideration. Let me move on. In your uh, proposed update to the process rule, one of the new changes is to make the process rule binding on DOE. My understanding is that this will mean that DOE will be required to follow the process and requirements established in the process rule when proposing future energy efficiency standards. Is that correct? That is, that is correct, yes. Okay. And could you please explain why the department believes that it, this is a necessary change in the process rule then? Sure. So uh, when the process rule was started in 1996, one of, the, one, of, one of the key features is that you have test procedures before you have, you finalize a test procedure, you know how you're going to measure energy before you set the standard for the energy or before you have a proposal for setting the standard for, uh, for energy consumption. That wasn't always followed. Um, and as a result, it becomes, uh, it becomes difficult to understand if you, uh, what the, where the standard should be if you don't know what, what the test is. And because those, um, because it is, uh, because uh, that had been messed up in a, in a number of rules or there had been a, a lack of following that procedure, we wanted to, to emphasize that that procedure is very important um, so that we get the substance of the rule correct. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. McNary for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California assumes the, the, uh, the microphone. Uh, thank you for your testimony this morning, Mr. Simons. Uh, and I appreciate your point about focusing on standards that have the most impact in terms of energy savings. However, by not regulating appliances with less than half a quad of energy, you are in effect causing consumers to pay increasing electricity costs. Wouldn't that be true? Uh, no, well, not necessarily, but, uh, but well, l let me be clear about what it is. It is half a quad, it is half a quad of savings or than 10%. So even if, it, even if it doesn't meet the half a quad savings, if there is a product that, that we could still achieve a 10% increase, we would uh, also increase the, the uh, could increase the standard for that product as well. Okay, that may be true, but still you're leaving a lot of products that, that without standards and that's gonna cause consumers to pay more for their electricity. Um, and this would in, in fact impact the lowest income Americans given the elect, uh, elasticity of, elect, of electric spending. So uh, we're doing consumers a disservice here. Uh, also, my understanding of the Energy Policy Conservation Act of 1975 is that it identifies products that DOE should set standards for energy efficiency and update them every seven years. But you're now saying that the DOE will not update any standards unless they meet your process rule. This violates the Congress's intent of constantly updating standards. What's your response? I'm, we are, no matter, well, no matter what, I mean, I think that's a misinterpretation of what we're saying in the process rule because we have to, fall, we have to meet the statutory requirements regardless of the process rule. Um, at, so we, because we understand that we, the, the process rule is not allowing us some kind of loophole to not, uh, to not follow EPCA. So does the process rule say that it will not update energy standards unless they meet the process rule? I mean, isn't there some sort no, of a no, block the, here? The, the process rule is saying that we will, we will review the standards and we, we need to make sure that it, that it meets the, the, the requirements in EPCA. So you, by reviewing standards doesn't mean updating standards and upgrading standards. And uh, EPCA does not require us to update standards. For example, at the, uh, at the end of the uh, previous administration, um, and we have the acting assistant secretary at the time here, uh, the, uh, the Obama administration did not update the standard for dishwashers. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Friedman can talk to you about that. Okay. Uh, update did not increase the standard for, for dishwashers, I should say. Okay, um, should we be uh, um, expanding the amount of covered products, uh, moving away from dishwashers and, and refrigerators to routers and telecommunications products? Well, it is, it is not the position of the administration to expand the scope of covered products. And these products are often called vampires because they sit there and, and, and consume power 24 hours a day whether they're being used or not. So. Uh, I think there's a need to be looking at those kind of products as well. And one, uh, and one note on that is that the, the industry has, uh, uh, the industry for dealing with set-top boxes um, did a voluntary program so that the, your, your DVR, your set-top boxes for, for TVs, um, to voluntarily set a, um, a standard for um, set-top boxes so that they improve the energy efficiency and, and they have uh, uh, dramatically increased the energy efficiency of those products through a through a voluntary program. Well, I'm a little skeptical of voluntary programs in, in, with these industries, but um, I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Washington State, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you in confirmation to serve as Secretary, Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. The Obama administration published new efficiency regu regulations at a record pace. Current administration appears to be taking a more deliberative and focused approach to achieve the maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is also technologically feasible and economically justified. I wanted to ask you to speak to the vision 
your vision for DOE's appliance standards program in general? Uh, overall, uh, the most important thing to me is that we are meeting our, our legal requirements. I mean, that's, that's what matters. Um, and those legal requirements are the deadlines, but they are also the, the substantive requirements in the statute. And the way that I think that we do the best job of meeting those substantive requirements is to follow the, the, the process laid out in the 1996 process rule. And I think is hopefully improved with our proposed updates to the process rule. Um, that uh, it, is, uh, it is important to follow the law. I mean, that is why um, I'm a member of the executive branch. My job is to execute the law. Um, and that is, uh, that's our number one priority. Well, I certainly appreciate hearing that from anyone in the executive branch. Uh, uh, another question, the appliance standards program has been around for decades. Is it true that many home appliances have already been sub subjected to three or even more rounds of successively tighter standards? Yes. Does the law require DOE to continue tightening these standards with no end in sight, even if you're seeing substantially diminishing returns? So what the law requires, a maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is technically feasible and economically justified. That's what we are required to look at. Um, that doesn't mean that the standard has to be uh, increased, particularly where, uh, where a, a product has been regulated multiple times and there just isn't as much uh, energy efficiency to squeeze out. Now that said, um, we are working um, and uh, on improving uh, on research and development so that there could be um, more headroom for uh, opportunities for the future. As in uh, things such as uh, solid state lighting, that's a, that's a good example of, of R&D uh, creating more efficient products over time. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And the chair, thanks to the general lady. Uh, now the chair recognizes the, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Assistant Secretary, welcome. Uh, and thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to uh, echo my colleagues' concerns over DOE's implementation of the standards program since 2017. DOE investments and policies have resulted in once unfathomable cost reductions in LED lighting somewhat an American technology uh, success story, uh, with the United States now leading the world in LED technology. These bulbs are available in the same shapes as the incandescent and halogen bulbs they replace and produce the same quality of light much more efficiently. This is the energy innovation all members claim they want. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, do you have a sense of those cost reductions over the last decade? Over the last decade, I believe it's greater than 90% for, for LED lighting. Which is a great bit of success. Certainly federal R&D investments have played a role, but is it fair to say that at least some of this cost reduction uh, costs can be attributed to market conditions created by energy conservation standards? Uh, it, it, it could be. I would say that it is probably more than some and that these kind of savings are achievable precisely because we have had a robust energy conservation standards program. So, Mr. Secretary, is it accurate that LED replacement bulbs are widely available, use less than one quarter of the amount of energy to produce the same amount of light, and can last as long as 10 years? Yes. So I'd like to unpack two issues from the February notice of proposed rulemaking. In 2007, in a law signed by President Bush, Congress included a backstop light bulb standard to ensure a minimum level of savings starting in 2020. Since DOE did not act by the 2017 deadline, can you explain why some officials have suggested that the statutory backstop hasn't been triggered? Sure, so to uh, that, uh, on the backstop there, there, it requires us to first make an, uh, for, first make an assessment. Um, that was, uh, we were forbidden from doing that through an appropriations rider for years. Uh, we were not allowed to look at the, uh, we were not allowed to expend funds to, to do the, the work necessary to make that finding and without making the finding, then the backstop doesn't so, happen. So what happens occur. then in, in January of 2020? Well, what does this mean in that regard? Currently, the, the backstop would not, uh, would not kick in because we haven't done the condition precedent. 
Well, isn't that against the law, the letter and spirit of the law? We were, we were forbidden from making, uh, from doing the, the work necessary to make the, um, to make the finding by the law, by appropriations law. So I think, you know, the concerns for affordability and energy efficiency enhancement are then lost because of that. Um, the second issue is that the proposal would change the definition of general service lamps to exclude certain shapes of bulbs that go into almost half of America's light sockets from the 2020 standard. You've spoken about energy affordability and I share that goal, but can you explain how this proposal promotes energy affordability? Well, first and foremost, the, pro the proposal complies with the law and that's, that, that's, that's the most important thing. As in, it could save all the money in the world, but if it's illegal and we get sued, we would lose. And so that uh, first and foremost, the, uh, our definitions are the statutory definitions of what is a, a general service lamp. Second of all, um, as, I, as I noted earlier, I truly believe that the, the future is solid state lighting, LEDs and other lights in the future, other types of, uh, of lighting such as OLEDs. Um, and many of these lights are available today and I believe that, the, the, well I believe, I know that there's massive uptake of consumers purchasing uh, even the lights that are not defined as general service lamps. But if the letter and spirit of the law is to address affordability and energy efficiency growth, why wouldn't we just embrace that opportunity to have that much more available for consumers and consumer savings? We can only, we can only do what we are legally uh, uh, allowed to do, and this well, is, but this the is an area- Well, but the law also we says no, there can no, not be any uh, rollback so in we, progress. We, so. which, which there has not been, what there has been is a well, change in definition. But it's a rollback if you, you have all of this opportunity now with this additional amount of sockets. These are huge savings for, for the consumer, for households, and an improvement in energy efficiency. Well, and I, I believe that the, the vast majority of consumers are going to achieve those, are going to achieve those, those, uh, those savings because you know, many of those, um, you know, the, the, many of those products are currently on the market and people are going to, uh, people will purchase LEDs. I mean, that, that's what, that is what, that is the, the trend in the market today. Could some people conclude that that was a backsliding, that you denied those opportunities that were enhanced in, in 2017? Well, that, uh, the, the department does not think so. Now, uh, well, NRDC do you think is so? on the, is on the next panel and they might have a different opinion on well, that. Do you think point. so? Do you think that's no. a backsliding? I, 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 I do, I, I and the department do not. Do you see it as a denial of some efficient, a great amount of efficiency improvement? There, there could be efficiency improvement, yes. Could be? There, there, there would be efficiency improvement. So you, you would deny that? Well, I'm a little bit lost in terms of what I would be affirming or denying, but uh, the, um, yeah, I'm not, not sure about the gentleman's, exact question, sir. I'm oh, sorry. The gentleman's well, I time yield, is expired. I yield back, Mr. Chair. The chair now recognizes my good friend from the state of West Virginia, the one and only uh, Mr. McKinley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you, Mr. Simmons, for appearing before us. Um, yeah, I, I, I look down the dais uh, and I look at some of the folks that I've worked with uh, in the last seven or eight years on energy efficiency with Peter Welch and, and uh, Tonko, we, we put several things together and I think we've been successful. I, I, I like working on energy efficiency. It's, it's an one of just two engineers in Congress, it makes a lot of sense for an engineer to be involved in this. But one of the issues that I don't understand from the previous administration, we couldn't get any traction. I'm curious to see whether or not in, in, in the efficiency, we make our buildings more and more, particularly our homes, uh, they're, they're probably the most demonstrative way that we can see that they're improving on energy efficiency. But in so doing, the previous administration, we, they've turned their back, the previous groups have turned their back on the indoor air quality because the more efficient, more tight we make our buildings, the less we're using, uh, uh, having fresh air and air turnovers. So I'm, I'm curious to see 
how we're going to how you're going to reconcile uh, energy efficiency uh, and a healthy environment on the inside of our buildings because we know that if we do the two to five air turnovers uh, in in uh, in any one any given room, that's going to increase the utility cost to that to the c consumer at that point. And that's what they do in schools. They just turn that off. They don't use that. So we're putting our children and our homeowners in unhealthy situations. Yes, we're efficient from a cost standpoint, but from a health standpoint, we're cutting corners. Are, are you, is this administration through, are you all going to be addressed? I don't know whether this comes up under your purview, your jurisdiction, or is this someone else within DOE that we would it's, be talking to? It, it, it's my purview, and, and it is an issue that we take seriously to make sure that, uh, that we are looking at ways to uh, um, both indoor air quality issues such as, such as mold when you have much tighter homes than we have had in the past, uh, but uh, we need to look at the, the, the health of the environment um, to make sure that as we are increasing the energy efficiency of our homes that we are not leading to uh, un unintended negative consequences. I, I don't think you're denying that it's, it's causing some consequences. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, like when you, but yes. we could not get the previous administration to address this. So we, we know that you spend 90% of your time indoors. Uh, and with the, without the air turnover, you're breathing fumes, you're breathing diseases, uh, uh, what they say, even with measles, the molecules are in the air for what, three days after, uh, after a person has left the room. I, I just wonder what we're doing, address, how we're gonna reconcile the combination of the two. Do you think you're gonna come out with something that might pass on uh, recommendations or thoughts to ASHRAE? Uh, to change or modify their standards, or what are we going to do for our school systems about getting as high efficient as they are, but yet they're putting our children in unhealthy environments? How, how, do, how do you think you're going to come out through this? I, I don't know. However, um, I know that our building technology office is thinking about this issue, and uh, I will uh, be more than happy to have them uh, discuss the issues with wh where we currently are, what we're currently doing with you. Um, as well as any of your any of your staff to or you know or whomever else uh, to make sure that we are that we're really considering the the health of the environment in indoors. Okay, I, I appreciate if you would get back to me. I, I do. Okay. So it, it forgetting putting aside for now, even though that's something I want to focus on indoor air quality. If what would be the what do you think is the most underutilized efficiency? project that a homeowner could undertake, what would be the one you think that would help the most? That is a, that is a, uh, the answer is going to be somewhere around heating and cooling, whether it is the HVAC system, um, because lighting is, is as, as efficient as lighting is now, it is now consuming a, a smaller and smaller part of people's, uh, people's overall electricity bill. So, uh, Something around uh, probably HVAC systems, if not uh, water heating. Okay, I yield back. Thank you. Chair, thanks, be gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Custer for um, New York for five. Thank you very much, Mr. Oh, no. Chairman, and thank you uh, to Mr. Simmons for appearing before us. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Today's topic touches on every single American household and business. Energy efficiency standards for home appliances have helped American families save billions of dollars in energy costs over the past 30 years. And that's why I'm so disappointed that the Department of Energy has failed to publish new energy efficiency standards, thereby violating the department's statutory obligations under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. According to DOE's own analysis, efficiency standards have helped American families save $63 billion on their utility bills in 2015. The department's failure to update efficiency standards is costly and will come at the expense of American families' pocketbooks, public health, and the environment. Mr. Simmons, I want to ask a series of just basic questions to understand the theory behind the delay. Would you agree that improved efficiency standards for home appliances have dramatically reduced carbon pollution in the United States? Yes. 
And would you agree that improved efficiency standards for home appliances have dramatically reduced aggregate home energy costs for families? Uh, they have helped. And would you agree that reduced carbon pollution is beneficial to public health and reducing rates of asthma and cardiovascular disease? Um, might disagree on that one. Uh, as in carbon dioxide. Do you not believe that lowering carbon pollution is helpful to the public health? Um, what, what I'm, I I'm wanted, an asthma what, what I survivor, to, so I'm just wondering. Well, I'm saying that carbon dioxide does not cause asthma. So I'm not. I'm but don't not, you believe that pollution in our air, including carbon, uh, increased carbon or lowering carbon, would improve upon the quality of air that we breathe and lower it, asthma rates? Yes, for for things such as particulate matter, I think that uh, that could that could help reduce um, asthma. Um, but you know we've we've seen increases in asthma rates as our air quality has improved over time. So I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure what is generating this increase of, of asthma uh, rates over time. That's, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And why would your department uh, fail to issue energy efficiency standards that could help us improve the quality of health, improve the quality of life, and save our planet? So there are... Um, there, there's, big, you know, one of the... One of the Things that is uh, very important for the president is uh, for there not to be unnecessary regulatory burdens. Well, let me uh, ask so you where this: we're, where we're not you required, agree that it would improve the quality of our life uh, if we save. You, you have said. Let me go back. You have said that uh, improved energy efficiency standards dramatically reduced aggregate home energy costs. On that, we have agreed. And you have said that you agree that reduced carbon pollution is beneficial to public health. Uh, you had a debate about the asthma. I do understand that. But would you agree or not? Maybe you don't agree. Well, do you agree that better energy efficiency is better for quality of life for American families? Yes, on that, that I will definitely agree. The better energy efficiency, it's one of the reasons that uh, that we spend millions of dollars a year doing research and development in the building technology office to improve, to improve energy efficiency overall. So if we can agree on that, um, do you, well, let me start with this. Is it correct that the Department of Energy has missed 16 legal deadlines for new energy efficiency standards for products? I believe so. And does the Department of Energy believe it no longer has to comply with statutory obligations under the Energy Policy and Conservation no. Act? So if you agree that the Department of Energy should comply, then why is your department engaging in the delay? That's what I'm uh, trying to say. We're not understand. engaging in the delay. We are working through the process that is required for each and every one of the of the products that we are required to regulate. That but is despite a, that is a missing process. 16 legal despite deadlines. Missing, despite missing deadlines, we are working through that process. The, the, the process is ongoing, um, but uh, I definitely What is do it not that we can do to help you and your department comply with these legal deadlines? Is it a question of lack of resources? What, what is it that you need from Congress? It, it's because not Because we want to improve the quality of life for our constituents, we want them to save money, not just low-income people, but all people. My husband and I spend quite a bit of time when we are choosing an appliance for our family to get the most energy efficient, cost effective. I live in New Hampshire. It's cold, energy costs are high. I try to get the best deal for my family. What can we do to help you so that we can help all Americans get that? best outcome? So the, I don't have a, a, a we have uh, sufficient resources. I, I have not heard from the program that we need uh, more resources. What we do need to do is to work through the process. And I do you think, think there's that we, a we are, lack of will in this administration? Uh, there is. Uh, so you keep falling back on the process. I'm the, wondering the if takes, there's a lack of will. The, the process takes a lot of time, and it is not, like, I have not heard from the... I, I yield back. I want to thank the gentlelady 
uh, and I also want to extend my apologies to her for misidentifying her state. She's from New Hampshire. And I apologize for not keeping a better eye on the clock. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from the great state of Illinois, Mr. Kissinger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you for, for yielding. Sir, thank you for being here. Congratulations. Um, this is, uh, it kind of feels reminiscent uh, when we had a prior administration. We were talking about deadlines a lot. It's just the process. Sometimes it takes some time, and uh, we appreciate you and your staff diligently working through these. I think it's safe to say that every member of this committee shares some common energy goals, including cleaner emissions and cost, sa cost savings for our constituents. Of course, like most issues in D.C., the devil's in the details, and it may seem to those watching or listening back home that the two parties stand against one another on the issue of energy efficiency and the environment. So I'd just like to state for the record that as we begin to debate in earnest on these important issues, I'm willing to work in a bipartisan fashion to address these issues. I, most people, if not everybody, is. Provided that we can stick to facts, we can avoid some of the uh, <laughs> unnecessary partisanship and engage in, in logical conversations. This hearing is focused on energy efficiency standards, for which I have a longstanding record and support. But we're currently grappling with a set of laws that, through subsequent regulation and court proceedings, have become, become unclear to the detriment of consumers and industry alike. When the industries that manufacture energy efficient consumer products are uncertain about the application of laws and regulations, it leads to less confidence. The lack of confidence can lead to higher production costs. Higher production costs are passed along to consumers. And of course, if the consumer is uncertain about the energy saving and cost savings benefit of these products, they could either pay more for less efficiency or if they're not so sure, they could altogether choose not to buy these energy efficient products. In sum, each of these issues should be thoughtfully addressed for the betterment of consumers, the environment, and yes, even industry. So uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to correct the record on some of the claims that are being made here. Uh, I understand there are about 50 active regulations that DOE plans to take action on in the coming year. Is DOE committed to following the law and carrying out its responsibilities under the Appliance Standards Program? Yes. We're going to hear testimony on the second panel that references a high percentage of consumers who experience a net cost for newer proposed product standards. In other words, the life cycle cost of the product will be greater than the savings from efficiency. Do you believe that increasing net costs for consumers fits the goals of Energy Policy and Conservation Act? No. How can DOE do a better job to ensure efficiency standards actually lead to consumer savings? Uh, one of the most important things I think that we can do is to have a robust, uh, open, transparent process of setting the standards so that, uh, so that we're making sure to take sufficient comment to understand all of the issues around a, uh, around a new standard so that uh, we, we don't get in situations or that they are as minimized to the greatest extent possible where we're imposing uh, negative impacts on, on certain classes of, of consumers. Yeah, I think it's important to remember you can impose you know, rules, and we're Congress, we can do whatever we want, imposing rules. The pro what we can't impose is human behavior. So human behavior has a reaction to any set of rules. Just like if something becomes convoluted, people can choose to go buy something else, maybe less energy efficient, and totally violate any goals that we have here in the House. Um, I have one other question. When considering the net costs, are there other features or performance attributes that consumers might lose? That, that, that can happen, and one of the... Um one of the challenges is what gets defined as a as a feature that is not always uh, that's not always clear. Um, one thing is you know that is a a, a perennial issue is uh, venting for uh, venting for furnaces or venting for uh, water heaters. Is that a is that a feature? Is that a performance feature? And uh, reasonable people can disagree. And I do have another question. The state of mission of EERE is to create and sustain American leadership in the transition to a global clean energy economy. The vision is a strong and prosperous America powered by clean, affordable, and secure energy. Are you committed to following the laws that Congress passes and Congress, as Congress intends? Yes. Has Congress provided EERE with sufficient resources to carry out its responsibilities? Currently, yes. How are you positioning EERE to create and sustain American leadership in the years ahead? Um, three things overall. Um, 
for, uh, for our office to, to focus on generally. One, the first is energy affordability, that we need to drive down the cost of all types of energy as well as the things that use energy. Number two, we need to figure out how to do a good job to bring together all of the, uh, all, all of the energy and all the users of energy together into, the, uh, into an energy system. We need flexibility in, a, in the electric grid of the future. And I think that that's, that's very important. It's one of the, the key things that the office is focused on. And then the third overall priority for my, uh, for my office is energy storage. Ways to look to have energy storage, especially a greater, um, because it can, they can improve that flexibility so you can have more things like more wind or more solar on the, on the electric grid of the future. Thank you. Thank you for your service, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. McKinchin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing today, and to the uh, Secretary, thank you for being here today as well. Increasing efficiency really means reducing waste, doing more with the resources we're already using, and reducing waste is an idea that I would think everyone should be able to support. Greater energy efficiency offers one of the paths of least resistance economically, technologically, and logistically for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So strengthening efficiency standards carries significant benefits for public health and for our environment. Mr. Simmons, in your testimony, you speak of DOE's, quote, statutory mandate to establish energy conservation standards that achieve the maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is technologically feasible and economically justified and that saves a significant amount of energy. What I would like to do with you today is to unpack the meaning of economically justified because what looks reasonable in one light may look unreasonable in another. I've introduced legislation to ensure that long-term climate impacts are properly weighted in the, regulatory, in the regulator's dollar and cents cost-benefit analysis, and I want to apply that same line of thinking here. In determining whether efficiency standards for many consumer products are justified, DOE is supposed to look at, among other considerations, the need for national energy and water conservation and other factors the Secretary considers relevant. Energy efficiency, as I've said, offers one of the paths of least resistance for reducing greenhouse gases. So it seems clear to me that the need for national energy conservation is urgent and great in that it reflects our need to minimize climate change and to mitigate its potentially devastating effects. And it seems equally clear, given the urgency of the challenges we face, that the current and projected state of our climate should be factors the Secretary deems highly relevant to the setting of energy conservation standards. Question, so to what extent does the reality of climate change and the climate consequences with which we are already living, having to live with influence standard setting decisions? So when we uh, when we do the, econo uh, the economic analysis, one of the, one of the things that is considered is climate. Um, it is. Uh, it has been in the uh, was in the, the the standards rule set by the Obama administration. It is in the um, that consideration is also in the standards rule set by uh, this administration. So, is it fair to say that DOE is grappling with the fact that absent significant increases in energy efficiency, our so our society could face existential threats within the lifetime of the folks in this room? Well, what we are what we are considering is the the impact of uh, of greenhouse gas emissions um, on the on the climate from the particular rules, given that that is what our mandate is. If I hear you correctly, then DOE acknowledges that climate considerations can and should play a role in shaping regulations. Can you speak to why that role is not greater? If nothing else, surely the urgency of our climate needs is comp is a compelling argument for moving forward on some of the standards the DOE has finalized but neglected to publish? So, well, you know, one, the, of the, you mentioned the seven factors that, are, that go into considering what is economically relevant. Uh, the first one is economic impact on consumers and manufacturers, lifetime operating costs uh, compared to increased cost. Uh, the talking about consumers is mentioned numerous times in EPCA. Climate is not mentioned in EPCA. Um, so while it is a, uh, while it gets uh, included in the overall economic analysis, uh, first and foremost, EPCA is designed to, uh, to, to, uh, to focus on consumers. 
currently. Now, obviously, Congress can change that. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The Chair, thanks, uh, the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm gonna head in the same uh, direction of sorts that uh, my colleague from Virginia, uh, Mr. McEachin just touched on, but in a slightly different vein, that's the economically justified aspect. And uh, Mr. Latta of Ohio previously brought some of this up, and that is, you know, are the consumers getting the same product, even if it's more energy efficient? Uh, we have, uh, we had some folks testifying a couple of years ago about hot water heaters, and they were going to lower the size of the hot water heater in an attempt to save energy. And I raised the point that if somebody has the money to buy a 100-gallon hot water heater, they probably have the money to buy two 50-gallon hot water heaters. And are you really making any, uh, any gain if, if, that's, if you just lower the size of the hot water heater? Likewise, I have a constituent who's been very upset, although this was an EPA rule, about her washing machine because they don't work as well now that they have uh, changed the rules some time ago. And so accordingly, she either uh, double does the wash, in other words, she has two loads where she would have had one, or on occasion when she has time to babysit her machine, she adds additional water to her machine because it doesn't currently, part of the way they got their efficiency was they didn't put as much water in it, therefore they didn't have as much water to heat. Well, she adds extra water to it to get around that so that she can get her clothes clean. And there were other problems, mold and other issues that came up. Is that a part of what you look at for economically justified as well? Is, it, is the consumer going to get what they want and are they likely to be running their uh, washing machines or their hot water heaters or their dishwashers twice as much to uh, accomplish the same thing, which actually adds to our energy demand as opposed to reducing it? Uh, that, that that is, uh, it can be included in the uh, whether or not something is economically justified. Also, there's another, uh, there's another statutory provision in EPCA that, uh, that uh, forbids us from reducing the, um, the, the performance or the, the features of a product. So it is, it is in EPCA. Uh, the question is, um, sometimes people can disagree about what that means. Well, and, and I, I, meant, I heard you mention earlier uh, windows in uh, ovens. Tell me, tell me what the fight there is. is well, there, there hasn't necessarily been a fight, but that's an example of something that is like, is, is this a, uh, deciding that that is a feature? And I think that everyone can agree that that, uh, nearly everyone can, like, we could have more efficient ovens if we didn't have a window on them. Mm -hmm. um, however. Most of your cooks so, so like could, to look. What, what's that? Most of your cooks like to look. <laughs> exactly, and, that, and, that, and that's the overall point, is that it could be more efficient, but, uh, but we need to have that feature because it is, uh, it is important to the function of the product to be able to look and to see if your, your pie is done. Well, and along those lines, if, if you don't have the window, aren't you gonna open that door more? Uh, and, yes. and, wouldn't, and couldn't that potentially lead to using more electricity? It, it could, or, or with, or uh, or with uh, dishwashers. If, if people mm -hmm. are spending more time washing their dishes by hand and running water, that may overall lead to more energy consumption than just putting a slightly dirty dish in the dishwasher. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you being here today. I look forward to uh, working with you on these issues, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the Chair, thanks the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Assistant Secretary Simmons, for being here. Um, your agency is one that oversees uh, some very imp important functions to as part of the federal government. And I wanna start by emphasizing um, the importance of issues to my state uh, of Delaware. Um, we're one of the lowest, we are the lowest mean elevation of any state in the country. And consequently, we are on the front lines of climate change. And while I know there's been some skepticism in the administration about the legitimacy of climate change and the sense of urgency that we must have, I can tell you that uh, my constituents see it firsthand uh, from constant beach erosion in Sussex County to the changing growing seasons in Kent County to chronic flooding in Newcastle County, climate change is a top priority for Delawareans. Um, as was mentioned here, this, uh, your work, energy efficiency, focuses on our health, it also focuses on our economy, and as I mentioned, the environment. 
one of the things that we want to do here is to be able to attack climate change as quickly as possible. And so energy efficiency plays a big role. And my colleagues have already shared some of their concern about the number of deadlines that have been missed uh, by the administration, even though they are mandated by law. But I want to shift and ask some different questions. Um, Mr. Simmons, in your testimony submitted to the committee, you say that one of your top priorities is energy affordability. Uh, with that priority in mind, do you, do you support uh, fully funding and utilizing programs such as LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program? So um, I don't... I don't have any. I don't have anything to do with as in. Correct. I, I don't have anything to do with LIHEAP. Right, I know so it's I, not I, under I really, your pure. Well, I, I, from the perspective of an uh, administration witness, I don't know enough to have a to have a comment on that one. I'm sorry. It's energy efficiency, low income program. How about the weather assistance program? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So the uh, you saw in the the previous uh, budget that the weatherization assistance program was zeroed out in the president's proposed budget. The new budget is coming out soon, and we'll see what is what it, what is there. One of the things that I really wanted to emphasize is that even though the weatherization assistance program was zero out zeroed out, that uh, that my office worked diligently as soon as co as funds were provided to carry out the the mission of that office, and that is what a, that is something that I think is is critical that we that we are doing that we are um, executing on the monies provided by Congress. Um, Mr. Simmons, in Title 10, Chapter 2, Part 430 of the Federal Code, there's a specific reference made to low-income families and the consideration the department must make when determining standard levels. Like the rest of the country, Delaware has seen an increase in the number of residents who are now renting rather than owning their home, own homes. And so obviously that means it's that those individuals are unable to make decisions to upgrade um, to more energy efficient appliances, but are still often saddled with the energy cost of more inefficient, inefficient appliances. Can you talk about what your department has done with rental properties in relation to energy efficiency? So overall, we are uh, the building technology office. I don't know if there's been any any specific focus on rental property as opposed to uh, all properties and trying to uh, increase um, energy efficiency of windows, energy efficiency of insulation. Um, as uh, one of the representatives uh, uh, pointed out previous, uh, Mr. Mc, uh, Mr. McKinley talking about um, increasing insulation that makes the the, the area uh, the housing tighter, which can lead to air quality issues, but we could put those aside for a minute. We're doing a lot of things in, uh, to over on research on, and development. Um, I don't know if there's been any specific focus on, on rental properties. One of the reasons why I ask is because when we don't deal with the standards that impact all of us, some of us don't get the same level of um, uh, support they need to be able to be energy efficient. But I want to shift one last question. Um, are there uh, strategic investments that can be made in an infrastructure policy package to accelerate energy efficiency strategies in buildings or industrial processes? And if so, what are they? That is a about 20 uh, yeah. sections, so you can we, we probably would, submit that in writing because I'm sure you won't exactly, get it all out. Exactly, exactly. Um, but it, you can start. You got. <laughs> uh, that, that's just what I was going to say. Is that that one is one that I'd have to get back to you in writing. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. Johnson from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Assistant Secretary Simmons. I'd like to start off by saying that. Uh, right up front, that DOE's work on efficiency standards is important. Uh, there is a benefit to these programs, but it's crucial that the process is fair and transparent. I, I think your work on the appliance standards program and bringing stakeholders into the fold early is uh, equally important and can result in a more workable and achievable uh, set of standards. Now. One important aspect of setting efficiency standards should be understanding the upfront cost to consumers of a product associated with any efficiency gains. Uh, I represent a very rural part of Ohio, eastern and southeastern Ohio, and uh, many of my constituents live paycheck to paycheck. And I worry that these standards could have a disproportionately adverse impact on low-income households uh, as the cost of appliances go up. So 
To what extent does, uh, does DOE consider the impact of cost to the consumer uh, in consideration for efficiency standards, especially as it relates to low-income households? So the, our, our statutory mandate is to, uh, con to look at the maximum improvement in energy efficiency that is technologically feasible and economically justified. And so in the consideration of what is economically justified, that is where we do the analysis to, to uh, try to the maximum extent possible to make sure that we are not uh, increasing the, the, the cost of products and making things more difficult. Because if you cannot afford a new product, if you cannot afford a new um, HVAC system, for example, then you're not going to receive any benefits from it. And you may then put in window units that are less efficient. So the, the cost considerations are of paramount importance. Um, <laughs> Any, can you just briefly uh, indicate any specific cost factors that you consider in, in that type of analysis? Well, there, there are seven. The uh, economic impact for consumers and manufacturers, and to do that we have to consider various types of consumers, whether it's you know, higher income or lower income. Um, the lifetime operating cost compared to increased cost, and that is a, that's, that's a big issue. If you can't afford it up front, you're not going to get those lifetime benefits. Um, projected energy savings, impact on utility uh, or performance. Um, so there is a, there's a number of, of factors that we consider that, uh, that, that directly look at um, making sure that as we are uh, increasing a standard that it does not uh, result in uh, consumer disutility or consumer harm. Okay. Uh, along similar lines, you know, we've seen uh, – DOE propose efficiency standards that raise the upfront cost of an appliance with the promise that we'll achieve those savings over time. In some cases, like dishwashers, the payback period could exceed 10 years. I can tell you, I got a dishwasher and I'm already having to do major repairs and I haven't had it for 10 years. So I would never achieve uh, that efficiency payback. So does, does DOE have any criteria for what it considers a fair payback period for appliances. Um, I would I would have to get back to you. To um, I I don't I don't think so. Um, th that we don't have a um, an exact level, but it is uh, it is one of the consideration that is looked at is what is the payback period because if if it gets if it gets very long if it's ten years um, in my opinion that that is far too long because of um, all of the possible intervening events that can happen in that in that ten years that. Yeah, Paybacks I, need to be quicker. I, I'm certainly not trying to be funny, but back to that paycheck to paycheck analysis, if it doesn't have a return on investment within the next month, <laughs> people in my people in rural America are, are, are going to be hard pressed to, to purchase efficiency systems. Um, can you uh, can you provide some examples where uh, the payback period exceeded the life of the product? Have you run across any of those? I believe Example. they exist. I don't have any at my fingertips currently. I'd be happy to provide that in writing. Okay. If you could get back to me, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I yield back a, a whole 26 seconds. Very generous today. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. O'Halloran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member for having this meeting today. Um, what we once thought to be cutting edge energy efficiency technologies of tomorrow are available today. And it is uh, this committee's responsibility to ensure that the Department of Energy confirms, to, continues to deploy energy efficiency standards as they are prescribed in the Energy Policy Conservation Act to not only benefit Americans, but also the environment we live in. The effects of climate change are impacting rural America the hardest, especially in my state of Arizona, where droughts are impacting our farmers, crop yields, uh, wildfires are devastating our national forests and parks. Uh, following the United States' fourth hottest summer on record, according to NOAA, these energy efficiency standards are, uh, we are discussing today have never been more important. Uh, the benefits of energy efficiency technologies are very clear. But protecting the environment should not be a partisan issue but rather a call to action in which members of both sides of the aisle may find common sense solutions. I, um, as a member of this committee, I, I, I'm new. And so I, I guess where I come from is uh, 
I, you're ahead of a fairly large group of people. Uh, when you put these projects together, uh, as you stated, you, you, your most important issue is to meet the statute requirements. And so what does that work plan that you put together look like in order to meet those? What's your timelines? What are your milestones? Do you put that together for each plan and so that you can make those, uh, make those guidelines become available to the public? So uh, that is, um, at, at, the, at the highest level, that is available to the public. That is the unified, uh, what's called the, the unified agenda of uh, regulatory and deregulatory actions. Um, the, that describes the, um, the 50 active regulatory actions that are currently uh, occurring in, um, in, the, in the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, that, the, the most recent update to that was in the fall. Um, in that there was 24 test procedures that were on the active agenda. There were 17 uh, energy conservation uh, standards that we are actively working on. Um, we have just sent um, updates to that to, uh, to OMB, to OIRA, um, for the spring unified agenda that will lay out what, um, what regulations are going, we are going to be actively working on. And uh, I expect that when we are um, done with that process, there'll be more um, we, we will be adding new um, active regulatory actions to that agenda. As you miss milestones and other deadlines, uh, do you try to identify, do you have a lack of personnel? Are, are there change orders that are coming in, similar to a construction project that require, whether it's political or otherwise, require changes that uh, would move that end date of accomplishment of meeting statutory requirements? Um, there is a... There is some uh, there's some internal work that I definitely can uh, can uh, engage in to make sure that we are doing a better job of meeting our our deadlines and uh, interacting with with staff. Um, I will uh, I've not spent as much time as uh, maybe as I would as I would like um, talking with the with, with the program about looking for. Uh, how they believe that we can do a better job of meeting our standards, and I will, I will, I will do that. Um, Has there been any request for additional uh, funding in order to be able to meet standards on a timely basis? Uh, not, not internally, no. Okay, uh, I, I guess uh, when I, um, I'm late getting my uh, tax in, if I am, I, I either file an extension and let everybody know in the IRS, or I uh, uh, get penalized uh, if I'm. Uh, late with a, a payment to the bank, uh, after a while they, they say, you, you owe your money. And uh, when we're late with getting a statutory requirement into Congress, I would think that our agency would say, we need to find a way to get it there on time. And I'm trying to figure out why that's not being accomplished. Uh, one of, you know, w one reason is, is that this, this process takes a long time, and it well, takes but, a long time you, to do right. But you know that at the beginning anyway. Uh, it's taken a long time, time after time after time. So the idea is to, the American people are waiting to be able to save money, to save energy, and to be more uh, efficient with the use of that energy. And the more that there are delays in the system, it is apparent from the billions of dollars of savings that are accomplished over, over time that we are costing the American taxpayers money, and it would be uh, efficient for us to be able to get these statutory requirements that you identified as the, the most important uh, process time. to get it finished. Thank may, you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. May, may I respond Thank to you. just say that that's, sure. a, that's, that's a good and valid point. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Bouchon from Indiana. Thank you, and thank you, Assistant Secretary, for being here. I, just, I was a doctor before. I just want to clarify that carbon dioxide is a byproduct of normal human respiration and in and of itself has no effect on cardiovascular disease or asthma, um, you know, that's been, that has been implied over and over in the climate discussion. I believe that the climate is changing, but to imply that it is that, that byproduct of respiration has a direct effect on, on those diseases is hyperbole and meant to uh, scare the American people. Why are four rules under litigation? Uh, four rules are, are under litigation uh, because we, uh, did not send them to the, uh, we did not finalize them by sending them to the Federal Register. Okay, 
Are these rules from the previous administration? Yes. Or? Okay, so the litigation it doesn't have anything to do with the rule itself. It has to do with the timing of submitting them to the register, or are there flaws in the that you can comment on in the rule that was the, the, lit, the litigation is about whether or not it is uh, it was legally permissible for us not to send them to the federal register. Okay, Good. thanks for clearing that up. Um, did the Obama administration that you're aware of meet all its statutory deadlines? Has this been a chronic problem? Uh, it, is, it has been a problem for multiple administrations, yeah, including... probably for decades, right? Yes. Every, yeah. So that's on us, on Congress, really, to help you with that, I would say. Um, so the proposed energy efficiency standards must be developed and tested using sound science, transparent data, and clear metrics for determining the economic justification. You've talked on about this some. Can you describe how your office plans to adhere to these most basic requirements in formulating new energy efficiency standards? Well, many of the issues have been highlighted today yeah. of, of, the, of the need that we have to make sure that we're doing a good job, um, whether it is uh, to making sure that these products uh, uh, have, have good performance, that they are not, um, that the cost increases, the possible cost increases are not unduly burdensome. Um, and that process can take time to make sure that we are uh, talking to and making, and that we're hearing from all stakeholders, from the general public. Uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, these are things that people interact with every single day. People interact with their, their dishwashers, with their microwaves, with their refrigerators, with their water heaters, with their HVAC systems. Um, uh, so it is it's critical that we get it right, and that can take time. Understood. Well, I think we can all agree energy efficiency is something every consumer and manufacturer should strive to, to adapt. Uh, however, I'm concerned that tightening energy efficiency standards to unrealistic levels could have unintended impact of costing American manufacturing jobs. And I'm from Indiana, and I think uh, we know the carrier case um, in Indiana. And when I met with the parent company, United Technologies, they said that the 50 standards that were put in place over the Obama administration made it impo essentially impossible for them to continue to manufacture in my state as one of the main factors. Um, uh, and because the regulations were piled on them very quickly, probably for the most part for ideological reasons. Um, and this can affect small manufacturers particularly that can't absorb this type of, uh, of uh, hit. So, you know, our state's a big manufacturing state, um, home to a lot of small manufacturers in the 8th District. So to what extent does the DOE take employment in impacts into account when they set efficiency standards? So in the, uh, one thing that we are legally required to do, and that is a, um, so it is very important that we do do it, is that when we are considering the, the factors that make up whether or not a rule is economically justified, one of, the, one of those factors is impact of uh, lessening of competition. And I think that that can be read in a number of ways. It doesn't explicitly talk about employment, but um, um, employment, I, I believe, should be included there because to, to make sure that, that the United States is as economically competitive as possible and that we're not reducing um, needlessly. Uh, so you would, probably, you would probably agree then that putting standards in place that are difficult to meet from an economic standpoint that results in jobs being transferred to uh, other countries than the United States um, probably be, need to be looked at pretty closely and that should be a substantial factor in, in applying these efficiency standards to, uh, to the United States. I, yeah, I mean, it is very much contrary to the, uh, the, uh, the administration's position to be shifting jobs outside the United States. Yeah, and I'd agree with grow, that. So. To grow U.S. manufacturing. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bouchon. The uh, chair recognizes himself. This question on efficiency standards, it's, it's interesting. I want to say a couple of things. Number one, there is a lot of bipartisan support for aggressive energy efficiency. That's number one. And in fact, when we passed in the House the Waxman-Markey bill that had as its goal 80% carbon reduction by 2050, 40% of the carbon reduction was through efficiency. Uh, secondly, there's been a lot of leadership uh, on the Republican side of the aisle when they were in the majority and now in the minority. So there's a real potential here for common ground. Third, efficiency standards play a major role. 
And some of my colleagues have been rightly raising some questions about what the impact is, which you're trying to assess. What does it do to small manufacturers? What does it do to consumer cost? But the bot and those are, those are very difficult questions. They have to be addressed because if it's unaffordable, it's not gonna, you're not gonna buy it, and you're not gonna get the, the lower ben the, the benefit. But a lot of manufacturers acknowledge that having standards that all of them have to compete to meet uh, and then have that out in the marketplace actually helps them because it's not a race to the bottom where competition is on the basis of the lowest quality product. So it does, I have sympathy for the challenge of these competing interests. Uh, you know, Mr. Johnson raised some questions, Mr. Bo uh, Dr. Bouchon just did, uh, and Mr. McKin, uh, 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 and others. But it does require that you get the standards out, uh, and that hasn't been happening. And, and I don't want to go into the, the delays in Obama or, or this administration, it doesn't matter. Bottom line, how are we going to get these standards out? You know, the, as I understand it, uh, there is a huge delay. Uh, we're very late in, in, in getting the energy efficiency improvements associated with the latest uh, model code. So. I'm kind of following up on what Mr. O'Halloran or Mr. O'Halloran said. What do we got to do to get these standards out from you? That's number one. Well, um, it's one of the reasons that uh, that we have the proposed process rule because we think that that will streamline the process by having an early look procedure where we have an assessment early in the process, and that if it isn't possible to meet our statutory requirements, uh, then we can uh, uh, more easily to move to the. Uh, to the, to the rules where the, there is the, the greatest um, opportunity for, for energy efficiency. So that's why it's also important to define uh, what is a significant savings of energy um, because the, the law requires, EPCA requires us to, yeah. uh, for rules to well, save a you know, significant you, amount You've got of a energy. hard job because of all these competing considerations you've got to take into account, but it really, we really need you to get that done. And then we can have an argument about what the impact is. Another issue is about the DOE loan program, and I understand that's a different office than uh, yours, but it overlaps a bit with your focus area. And currently, as I understand it, there's $5 billion in unused loan authority for renewables uh, that are available. That was a program authorized under the Bush administration. And can you tell us what's up and what we need to do to get that thing going? Um, I know that the, uh, the loan program is actively looking for projects. I know that they have talk to the, the wind office, for example, about um, uh, potential. One area could be um, offshore wind projects. Um, so they, what do we got to do? They're working on it. What, yeah. do we, what do we got to do to get those loans authorized? I, that, that I don't know. I, I can say that as the, the head of the loan program office said that, you know, LPO is open for business and that they have been, uh, they have been actively looking for, uh, for opportunities. Right. So you don't know, basically. I don't know more than what I just said. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that is frustrating, probably is frustrating for you as well. I mean, you've got that loan authority, you've got a lot of entrepreneurs out there. It's not a red state, blue state deal. A lot of folks who see an opportunity to make some money would be able to do it if they could get access to loans and move ahead. So I just urge you, to do all you can to implement that program or have, encourage it to be implemented. And finally, uh, I wanna take a step back and briefly ask about a few other efforts uh, at DOE. What steps are, are, is DOE taking to ensure energy efficiency R&D is being conducted at all levels, the early stage, the mid-stage, uh, in long-term focus? So we know where the, um that the, the key there is that, as Secretary Perry has said, we are following congressional direction. And so where we have congressional direction to, to, to be at early, mid, and late stage, we are, we are trying our best to meet that congressional direction. And you will see that in the, um, in the next few weeks when the Building Technology Office releases their, fun, their latest funding opportunity announcement. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing that. Well, Mr. Secretary, it's been a long morning, and I know <clears throat> you have uh, other important work that you have to uh, been done, and I want to thank you so very much 
for your participation here uh, during this first panel, and we uh, want to see you again soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, likewise, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rush. All right, and that concludes uh, panel one, and I would like to uh, invite uh, panel two to now uh, take his seats at the desk. Now that we are in set order, or, or sit order, <laughs> let me introduce the panelists beginning at my left. Uh, Mr. Andrew Nelaskis is the Executive Director of the Appliance Standards Awareness Project of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, Ms. Catherine Kennedy is the Senior Director of Climate and Clean Energy Program and the Natural, Natural Resources Defense Council, Council. Mr. Joseph M. McGuire is the President and CEO of the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, AHAM. Mr. Charles Herrick is the Senior Attorney for the Energy and Utility Issues of the National Consumer Law Center. Mr. Stephen Urey is President and CEO of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, AHRI. And Mr. David Friedman is the Vice President of Advocacy for Consumer Reports. And at this time, the Chair we now recognize each witness uh, of the second panel for five minutes to provide opening statements. Before we begin, I have the task of explaining the lighting system. In front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have 
one minute remaining, and the light, uh, please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. And with that, I will now recognize Mr. Nelaski for uh, five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and distinguished members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Andrew Delasky, and I am the Executive Director of the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. ASAP is a coalition project that's led by a steering committee consisting of efficiency advocacy organizations, state government representatives, consumer and environmental organizations, and utility companies. I'd like to do two things in my remarks today. First, I want to highlight how the existing national standards program benefits the nation. Second, I will describe for you how the current administration has badly mishandled the program. Appliance, equipment, and lighting efficiency standards are, are one of the foundations of U.S. energy policy. According to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, they are the number two federal policy for saving energy. The energy and water savings from appliance standards translate into pocketbook savings for consumers and businesses, create jobs, make our energy systems more resilient and reliable, foster technological innovation, and reduce emissions that harm public health and the environment. Some data for your consideration. The typical household spends about $500 less per year on their utility bills than if there had ever been any standards. That's equal to a 16% utility bill cut. It's hard to think of another policy out there that has done as much to improve the affordability of energy bills. All told, consumers, consumers' savings from existing standards for both, both for consumers and for businesses totals $2 trillion by 2030. It's the Department of Energy number. Jobs. When consumers and businesses spend their bill savings on other goods and services, research shows that that boosts employment. Standards boosted the number of domestic jobs by about 300,000 300, jobs in 2016. Next, saving energy with improved efficiency standards helps make our energy systems more resilient, reliable, and affordable. Climate change. U.S. carbon dioxide emissions in 2020 will be about 345 million metric tons lower or about 7% lower because of existing energy efficiency standards. Unfortunately, over the past two years, the National Appliance Standards Program has been seriously mishandled by DOE. I'll summarize five ways. First, DOE has missed 16 statutory deadlines for determining if current standards should be revised and is on track to miss 12 more, another dozen by January 2021. Updated standards could add hundreds of billions of dollars in savings for consumers. Second, the department has proposed to eliminate light bulb standards slated to take effect next year. Members serving on this committee today from both parties worked hard on that 2007 law that created light bulb standards. You did a good thing. You set initial standards starting in 2012 that, have, that are now saving enormous amounts of energy and money. Despite claims by some, the sky hasn't fallen. You also required a second stage to take effect in 2020 and created a minimum level for that 2020 standard, 45 lumens per watt. In providing 13 years of advance notice, you sent a clear signal to the market. and You helped unleash a torrent of innovation. LED light bulbs use just a smidgen of energy compared to the light bulbs they replace and last 10 to 15 years. But now, DOE has proposed to eliminate the 2020 light bulb standards by rescinding the 2017 rule that expanded standards to most everyday light bulbs and asserting, you heard it today, that the backstop standard does not apply. This action would cost a typical U.S. household about $115 in lost energy savings by 2025 on an annual basis. Carbon dioxide emissions in 2025 will be about 1% higher on a nationwide basis because of this rollback action. Where else can you get a policy that will save the, act the average household over $100 and also trim U.S. CO2 emissions by 1%? It makes zero sense to eliminate light bulb standards. Third, DOE has proposed an unnecessary rewrite of its standards development process rule that won't, that, that won't just make it harder to catch up on missed deadlines, it will put the national standards program into a deep freeze. Fourth, DOE has abused its enforcement discretion to issue broad policies that negate duly promulgated standards. DOE reversed course on one of these when, when the requesting industry group changed its mind, but the message has been sent DOE is open to simply not enforcing the law. Fifth, DOE now contemplates a petition from the gas industry that would, if acted on, 
eliminate consideration of the single most important technology for saving natural gas, condensing technology. We are very concerned that DOE would do as the gas industry has requested. These harmful policies represent a sharp break from how this program has been handled across prior administrations, both Republican and Democratic. Instead of building on the foundational energy policy of national appliance standards, this administration has taken a wrecking ball to it. The consequences will be higher utility bills for consumers, increased rate on our energy systems, more uncertainty for business, and needlessly higher levels of climate change and other pollution. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the staff is trying to get you some refreshments. I will give him, him a moment to make sure that he replaces uh, the water for you. Now, uh, the uh, chair recognizes uh, Ms. Kennedy for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this important hearing. My name is Catherine Kennedy, and I'm a senior director of the Climate and Clean Energy Program at NRDC. Climate change is the existential threat of our time. 2018 was the fourth warmest year on record. The human toll of climate change is immense, and the economic costs are reaching hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Indeed, nearly 20% of the federal deficit for fiscal year 2018 was in response to devastating wildfires, hurricanes, floods, and other natural disasters around the country. The impacts of climate change are felt most acutely by low-income communities and communities of color and by the most vulnerable Americans, especially children and the elderly. But together, we can still avoid the worst impacts of climate change using tools and technologies that are already available, first and foremost, energy efficiency. We know how to solve this problem. The biggest risks are inaction and delay. As NRDC explained in our recent report, America's clean energy frontier, the pathway to a safer climate future, using energy more efficiently is crucial to America's fights, efforts to fight climate change. It's our best weapon. Energy efficiency lowers carbon pollution and, and consumer energy bills, strengthens the electricity grid, and avoids the air and water pollution that threatens our health and that of our communities. Energy efficiency is the most equitable and affordable climate solution because as it lowers carbon pollution, it also lowers the energy burden on low-income Americans. DOE's Appliance Standards Program has a strong bipartisan track record. It was created in 1987 under a Republican president, a Republican Senate, and a Democratic House. For four decades, it has been enjoyed support not only from groups like NRDC, but from consumer and low-income uh, advocates, utilities, state officials, and many manufacturers. Our national standards program has already produced enormous carbon, energy, and dollar savings, but the best is still to come. As we energy wonks like to say, energy efficiency is the low-hanging fruit that keeps growing back uh, opportunities for further energy efficiency keep growing as technology and innovation continue to advance. Now is the time to dramatically scale up our energy efficiency program. Appliances and equipment have long lifetimes. Each inefficient piece of equipment installed today in our homes, businesses, and factories helps to lock in a higher level of global warming. The more we delay, the harder it will be to reverse course. We should continue the tradition of bipartisan support for energy efficiency standards. But the current administration has brought the DOE efficiency standards program to a grinding halt and is trying to put it in reverse. The agency has not issued one new or updated energy efficiency standard or even proposed any standards under this administration other than those issued by the Obama administration uh, or put in place by Congress. There is no room for excuses. DOE has clear legal deadlines to meet, and time and time again, this administration has failed to meet them. Instead, DOE is focused on unnecessary changes that will undermine the program and its impact. 
DOE is even attempting to gut lighting standards signed into law by President George W. Bush. Congress should be gravely concerned that DOE's illegal delays will have consequences stretching far beyond this administration. Fighting climate change without a robust energy efficiency standards program is like trying to finish a puzzle with missing pieces. It's harder, it takes longer, and in the end, it's impossible. That's not a risk we can afford to take. Instead of irresponsible and illegal delays and rollbacks, DOE should update energy efficiency standards on time and should act to expand the program's energy and carbon savings. This will benefit all Americans, our economy, and our environment, and will protect our children's future. Thank you, and I'll be happy to respond uh, to any questions. Thank you. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. McGuire for five minutes. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning on behalf of the home appliance industry. Our industry is a strong supporter of and participant in the Appliance Standards Program since its creation. We strongly support a system of federal standards and state preemption, and we do not support a rollback of any standards. The energy efficiency gains across major appliance categories are dramatic and undeniable. Modern refrigerators use the same amount of electricity as a 50-watt light bulb. A new clothes washer uses 73% less energy than it did in 1990, but can hold 20% more laundry. Today's average dishwasher uses 50% less water than in 2001. While the appliance program is successful, it is in need of modernization. Over the years, regardless of the administration, concerns have arisen when DOE has failed to move in an efficacious manner, too slowly, too quickly, and with no real prioritization. In 2005, DOE was directed by Congress to issue a standard for battery chargers by 2008. That did not happen. In 2007, a new law compelled DOE to act no later than July 1, 2011. DOE did not issue the final rule until 2016. And DOE has moved too quickly to publish a standard. The most alarming example of this was the 2015 proposed dishwasher rule. Manufacturer tests show that dishwashers could not clean dishes with such a small amount of water allowed by the standard. The economic analysis to support the proposed rule also showed the economic payback to the consumer was longer than the useful life of the product. To its credit, DOE did not dispute the test results provided by our members and pulled the proposed standard back. The overarching historical problem is that DOE's work and resources are based on arbitrary timelines set forth under EPCA. DOE's resources should be used efficiently to manage energy savings, not maximize rulemakings. In the last two Congresses, AHIM has advocated amendments to achieve these modernizations. We would welcome action on such legislation by this committee and the 116th Congress in a bipartisan manner. Short of achieving such legislative reforms, we have urged DOE to adopt some of these reforms administratively. We are pleased that DOE has proposed important but modest reforms in the past few weeks, and we look forward to studying them further and hope that the department will implement them. To be clear, much of the current process rule stays intact under the latest reforms proposed by DOE. We support a few common sense principles in the proposal. The first is that the agency should be required to follow the process it establishes to govern the regulatory program. Second, requirements on how to test a product should be final before a standard is proposed. Third, DO provide DOE the ability to better prioritize its regulatory work and to focus its resources on those products that offer the greatest opportunity for energy savings. And let me add a word about test procedures for home appliances. Virtually all federal appliance efficiency test procedures were initially built on industry-developed test standards. The new process rule requires DOE to rely on these voluntary accredited standards consistent with OMB directives where appropriate. DOE always had and will continue to have the ultimate say on federal test procedure construction. Our objective is to improve the regulatory environment in measurable ways that foster a fair, more predictable, more open, and more efficient regulatory landscape. 
we will continue to live up to our responsibility to provide consumers with life-enhancing products that deliver superior performance and energy and environmental benefits. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, in summary, we call on Congress to modernize EPCA so that DOE can better prioritize its work based on potential energy savings, improved transparency, and stakeholder engagement in a logical sequence to proposing test procedures and standards. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Now I recognize Mr. Herrick uh, for five minutes. Ranking Member Upton and members of the committee. Um, I thank you for the opportunity for allowing the National Consumer Law Center to offer testimony. It's truly a privilege to have the opportunity to provide NCLC's perspective on why regularly updated applying standards are so important for low-income consumers. Applying standards make home energy more affordable. For low-income consumers, this means fewer terminations of utility service and homes that are more comfortable and healthy to live in. Even from a narrow federal budget perspective, appliance standards help stretch federal fuel assistance dollars, the program um, referenced by the Congresswoman from Delaware, by lowering the household's heating and cooling bills. To provide some context for my comments, I will share some calls I had with a low-income consumer recently. The woman, I'll call her Susan, had been living without heat for three weeks because her landlady had done nothing to fix her heating system after it had stopped working. Susan is a working single mom with a school-aged child. While her heat was out, Boston had temperatures below 10 degrees, the same time that the Midwest was experiencing record cold temperatures. Her apartment was so cold that her son had a hard time getting up and going to school as he was anxious and lethargic. While the local Board of Health eventually cited the owner for serious sanitary code infractions, Susan had to tell the owner she would be going to court in order to get the heating system working again. For those of us who work with low-income households, experience teaches that when owners replace failed equipment, like the heating systems in Susan's home, they often go out and buy the lowest cost and least efficient unit that will replace the failed appliance. This leaves the tenants with higher energy bills. This is why imposing minimum appliance efficiency standards is so important for low-income people in particular. They are disproportionately renters. While the home ownership rate for the country as a whole is around 64%, home ownership rates among low-income households are around 30%. The major appliances which contribute most to energy bills, heating systems, air conditioners, water heaters, are almost always purchased by the owner. In the absence of good standards, low-income renters will become saddled with inefficient equipment and needlessly high bills for years. While some critics voice concerns about the cost of adopting efficiency standards, the Department of Energy operates under statutory mandates that require it to ensure that standards adopted provide net benefits to consumers. The statutory language which the Assistant Secretary referenced, I'll quote it, any new or amended energy conservation standard shall be designed to achieve the maximum improvement in efficiency which the Secretary determines is technologically feasible and economically justified. Historically, the Department has taken quite seriously those last five words, technologically feasible and economically justified. My office, the National Consumer Law Center, has been in several Department standards dockets. They do take years to complete, involve extensive analysis of the economic impacts on consumers, on manufacturers, and on the economy, and allow for all stakeholders to be heard. The department's own webpage says DOE regulations governing covered appliances are established through a rulemaking process that provides opportunities for public review and comment. Manufacturers, distributors, energy suppliers, efficiency and environmental advocates, and other members of the public are encouraged to participate in rulemakings, and in fact, they do. Um, if NCLC would make any criticism of the department's process, we would note that it is consistently erred on the side of overestimating the cost of manufacturers complying with the standards. Products sold after the standards go into effect often cost less than estimated, and consumer benefits have therefore been even greater than predicted. The net benefits to consumers of applying standards are impressive. The department estimates, again I'm quoting their website, standards saved American consumers $63 billion on their utility bills in 2015. 
Energy efficiency groups agree that standards have saved consumers billions of dollars in the near term and much more in the long term. Consumers thus face significant harm when the department unreasonably misses deadlines for updating appliance standards. The failure to promptly revise standards leaves consumers worse off as the sale of less efficient products leads to higher energy for the life of the product purchased. For major residential products, heating systems, air conditioners, water heaters, the aggregate loss to consumers can easily reach hundreds of millions of dollars depending on how late the department is in finally revising that standard. Moreover, because the more efficient products will result in lower energy bills, failure to revise standards can affect consumer health as well, since higher energy bills lead directly to terminations. In conclusions, we applaud the committee for, for holding this important hearing and hope the committee will succeed in getting the department to meet all deadlines. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the witness, and now the chair recognizes Mr. Urich for five minutes. You might come on, on, on. I think you need to hit that to get a button there, I think. Okay. Well, speak a little closer, maybe move it. Oh, there little. it goes. Now it's back. Now it's on. <laughs> More than 1.3 million American jobs throughout its supply and distribution chain. And I want to make it very clear that our industry has a long and proven record of leadership when it comes to innovation and energy efficiency. I'm here today to discuss three main points. Mr. Eric, excuse me, will you pull your microphone closer to you? With staff, system. There we go. That close yep. So first, we agree that the Department of Energy do all it can to promulgate regulations in a timely manner while adhering to the requirements that energy standard be technically feasible and economically justified. Our industry is unequivocally opposed to delays in rulemakings, as we always have been. In fact, in 2005, we joined a lawsuit against DOE to require them to issue rules in a timely manner. However, the amendments enacted in EPAC 2007 actually increase this burden on DOE by mandating a six-year review of all efficiency standards and a seven-year review of all test procedures. AHRI and its members' companies are best served when the proper amount of time is devoted to each rulemaking rather than cut short because of the need to catch up to meet a standard. The history of fe feast or famine rulemaking by DOE negatively impacts consumers and manufacturers. For consumers, it increases the cost of products they rely on for their comfort, health, and safety. For manufacturers, it increases uncertainty and hampers planning for future research, development, testing, and production of the next generation of equipment. Therefore, we join the subcommittee in its call for DOE to do everything it can to complete rulemakings in a timely manner. Second, we applaud DOE for recently issuing a proposed rule updating the process rule. While we will submit comments with suggestions, suggestions on ways that the proposed rule might be improved, we are pleased that DOE intends to, for the rule to be binding on the department rather than mere guidance as claimed by DOE in the past. When all parties are aware of the process, rulemakings are more transparent, economical, and predictable. Finally, we believe that the above two points make the case for a bipartisan congressional action to reauthorize and reform the nearly 45-year-old EPCA to bring it into the 21st century. While EPCA was a bipartisan response to the energy crisis of the mid-1970s and has been extremely successful, the fact remains it's nearly 45 years old and a tremendous amount has changed since then. EPCA reform should stress flexibility, enhance technical and economic justification. Giving short shrift to such analysis in order to meet arbitrary statutory deadlines results in poorly constructed rules that place undue burdens on small businesses with wide-ranging ramifications for our industry and the 1.3 million employees who depend on it. Under current law, before a standard is even in effect, 
DOE must announce the commencement of its work on the next version of that standard, all to comply with the six-year mandated rulemaking cycle. We are not suggesting no additional rulemakings, nor will we ever suggest rolling back efficiency standards for any product category. Manufacturers in the market are simply not given enough time to adjust to new regulatory requirements. Our equipment is designed to remain in the service for more than a decade, so the market for new products must be viewed in the long term, not in six-year increments. A reformed EPCA would require the new rulemakings to take a, include a look back to determine the effectiveness of the previous rule as it pertains to actual energy savings and associated costs. Every time DOE issues a new rule, it issues a press release that extols its estimate of the rule's benefits and cost savings for consumers and energy savings for the nation. But DOE has never looked back to see what the energy savings were or if consumers ever recover the additional money it costs them up front for the more efficient equipment. This needs to change. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, many people believe that a divided government such as we have today makes it less likely for progress to be achieved on important issues. We do not see it that way. Rather, we see this as an opportunity for people of goodwill to meet in a spirit of cooperation and compromise to bring about necessary change. Therefore, the opportune time for updating EPCA is now. AHRI and our members are committed to openness and cooperation with Congress, allied trade associations, efficiency advocates, and the DOEs on ways we can all work together to improve this nearly 45-year-old law. We invite all stakeholders to join us and work together to craft an updated regulatory scheme that meets the needs of the current and future market while achieving the nation's energy goals. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. That concludes the opening statements. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Freeman, please accept my apology. You're recognized for five minutes. I'm not sure. I, don't I apologize. Dealing with the technical difficulties. You just feel like the president. You get three mics, right? You there you go. Time. There you go. I just want to be closer to the middle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Consumer Reports, our more than six million members, and Americans who together spend nearly $325 billion a year on their household energy bills. Now, as a nation, we've known for more than 240 years that some truths are self-evident. So with tongue partly in cheek, I'd point to the self-evident truth that the cheapest energy is the energy you never use. And it is energy efficiency standards that deliver just that. Or, to use the Assistant Secretary's frame, the most affordable energy is the energy you never use. Now, I saw that self-evident truth firsthand when I sat in the same chair as the Assistant Secretary a few years ago. When the Department of Energy is active on energy efficiency standards, the benefits truly add up. In fact, they've delivered a five to one return on investment for every American that should be the envy of Wall Street. And here, investment is truly a key word. These standards are an investment in American ingenuity. Our top companies look to these standards both for market certainty and to continue driving innovations into the market. They create a series of good, better, and best models of a product and count on DOE staff to survey that progress as they set the next standard. These companies see their R&D dollars pay off and create new jobs as the market changes, while consumers save a lot of money from this virtuous cycle. The only other option, frankly, is a race to the bottom, which is what, happen, what will happen if we buy into those here who seem to think that American ingenuity is nearly tapped out. Plenty of companies overseas are happy to keep the bar low, dumping their barely compliant products on our markets while other countries get the latest technology. Now, in contrast, as I think you've already heard today, lighting shows what happens when you invest in innovation. 
I mean, you can walk through any hardware store now and you can choose LEDs that have daylight, soft white, dimmable bulbs, programmable bulbs, <coughs> floodlights, candelabra lights, bulb lights, Christmas lights, I even saw some menorah lights. You can get anything you need. And all those amazing choices are thanks to a mix of efficiency standards set by Congress in this case and other investments in innovation. Now, building on this success story, near the end of my time at DOE, staff put forward a well-reasoned plan to expand the definition of general service lamps so more choices and savings could be available for more Americans. This administration's rollback will reduce consumer choice and make utility bills less affordable. Now, from reading the proposal, the decision was clearly not about consumers or affordable energy. Instead, they appeared to rely on legal gymnastics to argue that what was perfectly legal in 2016 was no longer allowed just a few years later. Of course, the law didn't change. Adding insult to injury, the department's process rule update is filled with red tape. And frankly, I find it shocking that when Congress puts down deadlines or creates process, it's called arbitrary. It's called optional. And yet, when we have new administration process, it's called necessary and must be binding. I don't think that's the way the Constitution works. DOE should be focused on helping Americans, not adding new red tape that further slows down the process and appears designed to help companies tie up these standards in courts. Making matters worse, the proposal sets an arbitrary threshold for whether or not some household products can ever get a new or stronger standard. These retrospective this retrospective-based threshold is completely out of step with modern life, where we rely on consumer electronics and other gadgets that don't use a ton of energy individually, but together account for nearly 40% of home electricity use. That shouldn't be off limits. Now, sadly, administration decisions that leave American consumers footing the bill are all too common these days from rollbacks on fuel economy standards that will cost consumers more than $400 billion to rollbacks on predatory loan protections and net neutrality. The scales are being tipped further and further away from every Americans. The solution is for all of us, consumers, government, and leading businesses to ensure that innovation and technological progress serve the interests of the American people again. And that means being guided by self-evident truths. And in closing, developing standards that allow the talented federal staff to get back to work on timely, transparent, data-driven standards that will save consumers money and help put the marketplace back in balance. And I hope that's what we can deliver together. Thank you. I want to thank the witnesses and all the witnesses. We have now concluded the opening statements and we will move toward member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Herrick, when did the National Consumer Law Center first become involved with DOE applying standards dockets and why? And additionally, how does the delay or rollback of efficiency standards impact low income Consumers. I joined the National Consumer Law Center in 2000, and it may be no surprise, this is not our primary work applying standards. We are mostly trying to make sure people don't freeze in the winter of cold, don't die of the heat in the summer, have the lights on and the appliances they need. Um, but some of my colleagues here brought to my attention uh, the, uh, that there were standards proceedings, and at the time the furnace standards proceedings were moving and it became apparent that that's a really important issue for low-income consumers. I live in Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're in Illinois. These are cold states where people's heating bills are just about the largest bill they face, and if they lose their heating, that's one of the gravest threats they can face. So we became involved in this from the perspective that it's very important for there to be standards that keep bills down on those major appliances for low-income people. And as I mentioned in my testimony, particularly because they are so disproportionately tenants, no tenant buys a heating system. Uh, tenants don't uh, buy so a lot of the major appliances, and they really can be saddled with bills. And so when you ask about what's the 
um, impact of delay. You know, you heard a little bit from the Assistant Secretary. There's a pretty complicated scheme of what DOE looks at. And one of the things they look at is the percentage of consumers who are better off if the standard passes and the percentage who are not. And there's always some shakedown of between that. But when DOE issues the rules, because the vast majority of people would benefit by that standard getting out the door. Well, the logical converse of that is if you don't get it out of the door, the majority of consumers are going to be harmed because those less efficient appliances are in the market. And it's perhaps why I started with the story about that client with their heating system down. That's the reality of appliance standards. It is important when a Susan of the world has her heating system down that the landlord cannot buy something that's extremely inefficient. Mr. Freeman, as the former principal director, deputy assistant secretary and acting assistant secretary of uh, Energy's uh, Office of Efficiency and Renewable Energy, ERE, can you briefly discuss the important role that negotiated rule makers have played in building consensus? Uh, from your understanding, how would this new pro process rule impact negotiated rule making? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Um, the vast majority of the times, uh, DOE staff is able to dive in, look at the data, and produce standards that work for all Americans and work for industry. At times, some of the standards are more controversial, and so staff rely on a, a, a negotiated rulemaking process, which it, it's pretty straightforward. You get everyone around the table, and you talk about what works, and you try to find a consensus that helps everyone. It's been incredibly successful at breaking through log jams. Uh, one of the things I fear that's going to happen uh, with this new process rule is because it, if it is binding, it's going to allow companies to tie up every single step in the courts so you'll never even get to negotiated rulemaking. And you would strangle the opportunity for industry and consumers to work together with government to make things better for all. Mr. Nalaski, do you have any um, input that you would like to offer on the same question? Uh, yes, and I, I served as the chair of the Federal Advisory Committee that worked on negotiated rulemaking for, um, from 2012 until 2018. Uh, yes, can just, so I, I served as a, as a chair of the, of the Federal Advisory Committee that, that contributed to that process between 2012 and 2018. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that the process rule as proposed would make <clears throat> um, successful negotiation far less likely. Um, uh, for the reasons that Mr. Friedman has described, uh, that's probably first and foremost, is that it's going to freeze up the process altogether. So why negotiate if there's no risk that the department's going to act at all? Right? So the incentive to come to the table to negotiate has been, has been you know, uh, massively reduced. Uh, the second thing it does, and I think all of us actually would agree on this, is that it, it, it takes away the, the ability to um, do creative things in negotiation that enable success, like looking at flexible compliance dates, um, such as looking at uh, different standards um, for different equipment types. Um, so some of that flexibility that's been taken away by the process rule will really reduce the ability for, when you take away options on the, off the table, that makes agreement harder to, to achieve. And that's what the process rule, as proposed, would do. Thank you. And that concludes the chairman's uh, time. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes uh, for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, appreciate all of your testimony. I think that it's uh, pretty apparent that all of us uh, want uh, appliance standards, uh, energy efficiency standards for appliances. Uh, Mr. Friedman, you made a a very good point that the industry does want these, particularly the domestic industry here, uh, because we can beat anyone else uh, in the rest of the world. And we also know that there is a direct payback to all of the Americans uh, that are able to, to use that. And I know, Mr. McGuire, you share that thought as uh, AHAM. Uh, you know that your member companies uh, share those, those same views. I might have, I have a, a couple comments, Mr. Aham, or Mr. Aham, and Mr. McGuire. <laughs> you indicated in, in your testimony, you, you didn't read it all, which is good, because you summarized it, but you, you said on uh, page nine, uh, home appliances are now in an endless cycle of regulation. 
uh, where as soon as one com compliance effort ends or is near completion, another round of regulation to change the standard again begins. No time for manufacturers to catch their breath. Just as importantly, there is no time for DOE, manufacturers or efficiency advocates to assess the success of standards or review their impacts on consumers and manufacturers. What should the timing be? Should it, should it be come at the uh, certain period after the regulations are, are finalized? What, what should that look back period be? What, what would you suggest? Well, for, first of all, the, the six year look back, that clock starts running as soon as the rulemaking is completed for the standard. And then, um, so before the, the companies have the ability to sell through product to the existing standard, DOE is already in the process of, of a rulemaking to change it. So the manufacturers have to be involved in that. The other fundamental problem is that there's a six year look back for standards, there's a seven year look back for test procedures. They're out of sequence. You have to have a completed test procedure before you can test a product to see how much energy it uses and if it can meet the standard. So we think that sequence needs to be changed, needs to be looked at. And secondly, DOE is really hamstrung between the statutory look back requirement and the statutory balancing test of maximum technological feasibility, significant energy savings, and, and economic justification. They're hamstrung, they're never gonna have the resources, they never have had the resources to do a good job on all these rulemakings at the same time. We, we've seen the, the perils of when they try to do that. So a, a new process, an amendment to EPCA could be that for some products who have been through three and four different standards, the diminishing returns of the energy savings are there. Those products ought to be in a separate class where they don't have to go through a serial look back every time unless, as uh, Assistant Secretary Simmons said, through R&D that DOE does or that companies do, a technological breakthrough is, is determined and then a quick look can happen. So there needs to be prioritization. The vast energy savings ha have been achieved for many products and we're at a diminishing return for others. So DOE should not be spending a lot of time on the, on the products that only delivered 4% of all the energy savings. And the Congress, and I think just about every group at this table, could work together in trying to find a solution to this law which has had success. And, and Mr., uh, I, get it. I want Mr. Friedman to, to respond to that, but also the actual testing of the appliances. Uh, it's not like here in D.C. at, at DOE, right? Is it? How, how do you, it, as a consumer's report, do you, do you have your own labs where you, where you test them? Or, or do you take the data from the companies themselves? You've you got to use the three mics again. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Consumer Reports, yes, we have our own testing labs in, and up in Yonkers, New York, as well as an auto test track. Uh, out in Connecticut. So we rely on our own data. We take no advertising dollars. We take no samples. We ensure that all of our results are independent. And similarly, the federal and government- And do they usually match up with what, what the Energy Star you know, so we, labels uh, indicate? We don't do compliance testing. Um, we do comparative testing. So it would be unfair to necessarily compare their data to our data. Um, we try to make sure that consumers can make the, the best choices when they walk into the marketplace. Whereas the Department of Energy's role is to ensure that a rising tide lift all boats, whereas we help people find the very best of the best uh, that are out there. Um, I would also just add, um, you know, I, I personally think the staff did an amazing job during the Obama administration of, of producing a lot of rules, and, and they were in a tough spot, right? They were trying to catch up after years of neglect uh, of the program, and they worked quite well under existing processes and helped many, many, many Americans save quite a lot of uh, resources. Um, I would also just add that it's surprising to me the lack of faith that folks have uh, in American innovation and the ability to keep pushing the boundaries of technology. If anything, the pace of innovation is changing so fast that six years from now, you know, this is probably going to be obsolete. So the ability of the department to not just keep up with, but try to stay ahead of technology and move quickly is incredibly important. I would hate to see anything slow down given the pace of innovation in this country, which I know you, you share a, a faith in. 
Well, just to conclude, because I know my time has expired, uh, uh, it, we're going to see amazing energy savings in, in a whole host of products. And I'm going to be talking to the chairman later on about actually having a hearing on where we're going uh, in the future. So with that, I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to continue with Mr. Friedman, but your name tags are all <laughs> messed up. So um, uh, just for the purposes of the TV. Um, so uh, Mr. McGuire had an interesting idea about triaging the right kind of uh, technology to focus on. Is there, do you have an objection to that? Does that make sense to you? The notion that if something's been gone through standards and there's been no basic research that's informed the, the uh, technology that we would focus on other things? Is that, is that objectionable? Look, I'm an engineer, I'm very practical about things. Um, so I see no objection to that, but I also see no reason to add new red tape to get there. The DOE staff is perfectly capable of looking at the data, seeing whether or not there's a significant opportunity, and moving forward with other opportunities. Adding more red tape doesn't actually speed that up, it slows it down. So again, I would go back to, there's really talented folks there, let them do their work. Right, I guess the question he was, the issue point he was raising is that um, there may be more return on applying their work in particular areas rather than others. And that's something that should be left to them, you think? Well, and absolutely. I mean, it, obviously, technology allows much more return to keep happening than we might expect today. Uh, and it's, it's DOE staff's job to keep up to date on that. And they can already, under the current process, make decisions like that to focus on areas that are, um, can deliver the most savings. Let me ask with Mr. others, Mc if they can't, they just say they're not ready to be updated. Let me ask Mr. McGuire, what is it that keeps them from making that decision on their own? I think the, the statute um, and uh, resources uh, prevent them from doing a realistic. What about the statute prevents that, though? because of the, of the look back requirements, right. out of sync between standards and test procedures, balanced against this test of savings of energy and economic justification. So no real prioritization has really occurred. Every look back, except for, I think, one, has resulted in a full-blown rulemaking to go forward. The only time in our products that didn't happen was after the new standard was proposed, we demonstrated that it would harm performance of the product, and then DOE pulled it back. Okay. The uh, process worked. So I, I, think, I think it's a reasonable point to raise if, if, we do, um, if we do some reform here. Ms. Kennedy, I wanted to ask you, do you perceive the issues that you have with the regime as mostly um, in the nature of oversight of how things are administered, or do you think that there are uh, statutory changes that are needed in the field to make sure that we're supporting climate change to the greatest ex extent, or supporting climate action to the great extent possible? Uh, well, certainly there's a, there's a need for comprehensive U.S. climate legislation to address both clean energy and the climate crisis. Within the four corners of, of uh, EPCA, this statute, uh, I think that this subcommittee should look closely at opportunities to expand the program, as should the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy has the ability to expand the scope of the program in, a, in, in various ways. And of course, Congress over the years has added new products to the statute, such as lighting, uh, and has thus brought to the fore really incredible energy efficiency. And I think, I think lighting has been a tremendous success. And I, I wanna know if, you, if you're aware of other things out there that we should be considering as a legislative body today. I think looking at the issue of consumer electronics is, is very important. Uh, and I would also counsel you that the products already covered by the statute can still produce significant energy efficiency improvements. So this idea in the process rule that we should uh, uh, set a arbitrary standard for, uh, for energy efficiency savings of 0.5 quads is really misguided. We need all the energy efficiency savings we can get. The statute makes sure that every standard is economically justified, whether the savings are immense uh, or slightly less so. I'm just, I'm just really, what I'm trying to do is make sure that I understand what legislative action is required, because I can't tell the, the administration how to 
administer this. So if we give them authority to do great things, they decide they don't want to do that, that's their call. But what I need to know, and I'd ask for all of you going forward, is if you'd like to see reforms, and, I, and Mr. Urich, I think you're Mr. Urich, Mr. Urich, um, <laughs> you had some ideas specifically. Uh, I'd like to know specifically what would, you, what would you like to see in terms of reform so we can get about doing the job that we need to do. I also take up Mr. Um, Upkin's, Upton's suggestion that we talk about consumer electronics because that's probably something that the legislature hasn't looked at. But again, uh, not to be parochial, but I need to know what we, we want to put into legislation. And so to the extent you can help us with that, we'll look forward to working with you all. And Mr. Chairman, are you, are you back? California, if I may, uh, you know, provides, should provide lots of ideas for Congress to... Of to course you're right. Uh, my time has expired. <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lotto for five minutes. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing and to our panel witness. Uh, thanks very much for being with us today. Uh, Mr. McGuire and Mr. Urich, um, as you're probably aware, in the last Congress I worked on and will continue to work on this Congress on bipartisan EPCA reform. And in your views, what should Congress prioritize as we consider modernizing uh, EPCA? And Mr. McGuire, I'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Letta. Um, well, I, I think, first of all, with regard to the rulemaking process, addressing the look back time frame for standards and test procedures and to uh, consider a, a provision where they at least could be coordinated better. But secondly, for those products where, that have been through several standards, generations of standards, such as home appliances, uh, they would essentially go to the bottom of the list in terms of DOE prioritizing work, looking for significant energy savings. And I think this, this quick uh, assessment uh, that DOE proposed is a good concept to think about so that there is a bright line threshold for significant energy savings. If that can't be found, and it's, it's overwhelming that it can't be found, why spend three years on a rulemaking trying to determine if it's economically justified? Mr. York? Um, I agree uh, with the, the position taken by Mr. McGuire, but I think it's really looking at this and saying, you know, what was done before 2007 was DOE did a pro prioritized the, the rules that needed to be done and concentrated on those where they saw the greatest energy savings. The amendment of EPAC 2007 then all of a sudden put these mandatory six-year review for standards, seven-year for test procedures into the act for all products. And for all products, it doesn't make sense. And I, so I think it's giving and looking at how can you give DOE the authority to look at this, prioritize what needs to be done focus on the products where we're gonna have the energy savings and, and can get those right away versus wasting all this time doing all these evaluations. Yes, the clothes washer procedure worked that time, but that took how many years? Three, four years of DOE staff time, analysis and other things. The industry's time for something where there was no energy savings, which instead look at it, figure out how we can prioritize it and focus on where the biggest energy savings are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, you mentioned in your written testimony the example of DOE's proposed standard for dishwashers and how the standard was uh, such that uh, some dishwashers could no longer get the job done. And it's a good example of something that I want to make sure that DOE is taking into consideration. How does DOE ensure that a proposed standard won't negatively impact uh, product performance? Because, you know, we've heard from other members up here about, uh, you know, you don't want to end up having to do the thing, you know, whatever you're doing with that appliance twice or three times because you're wasting more energy. Right. Well, I think Mr. Simmons described the, the dilemma the department has in making sure that the performance of the product isn't jeopardized, and that in part has led to uh, difficulty meeting these statutory deadlines. In the case of dishwashers, uh, DOE had proposed the most stringent of three options in terms of reducing energy and uh, water use. And uh, our industry during the proceedings said, we think that most stringent level is not gonna work for the product. And DOE, the process didn't allow enough time for our, our industry to test products uh, for performance. And DOE proposed this most stringent level. We then did the testing and it, it was clear that products from multiple manufacturers could not clean the dishes. So there's something wrong with a process that goes 
they, they missed that on the performance. And, there, and there's something you could say, well, we caught it in our comments, but that could have been done before DOE reached it. You know, if I interrupt, okay, so what, what did, when, when that occurred, what, what did DOE tell you? You know, you're saying that, you know, we're having problems, but they say just keep it going anyway? Well, they said their consultant said it's fine. It, it won't be a performance problem. That's why we undertook the testing. In, in the laboratories that, that are used for compliance for DOE, Energy Star, and standards, and uh, prove without, without a doubt that multiple loads of dishes could not be cleaned with, with, with about one gallon of water in a cycle. That's real, what they had reduced it to, 1.1 gallons. We showed them that and they said, you're right. And then they pulled it back and said, no standard is justified. And by the way, the standard that they had proposed had a payback to the consumer of 20 years. The life cycle of a product, a dishwasher, is 13 years. Now, how does that make sense? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, and I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, full committee chairman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assistant Secretary Simmons stated on the first panel that the proposed process rule is to, quote, reduce the burden of the process to create, test, and implement new energy efficiency standards. But after reviewing the proposed process rule, it appears to me that steps are added to the process with the appearance of lengthening the process. While the proposed process rule is thin on some details, I count about 17 steps to make and implement a new standard, and I find it hard to believe it will be more efficient. So I wanted to ask Mr. Delasky, can you walk the committee through the standard making process under the proposed process rule and compare to the current rulemaking process, how much longer do you estimate that each rulemaking will take under this proposed process? I'm not sure I can walk you through it. It's, uh, I have a colleague who has uh, mapped it out for us. Okay, that's good enough. Um, it is complicated. Explain it though. There's a lot I of steps to this. Um, the, the current process under under ideal circumstances, the current process takes about three years. Um, this has added multiple additional steps, and as has been referenced earlier, some of these earlier steps now become a final step that would be a possibility for litigation. So if the current process takes three years at best, I would submit to you that typically it takes longer, as we've heard sometimes today. Um, based on my experience, you know, working with the program over the past 20 years, I would expect that this is likely a recipe to at least double the, the, the duration of the process, if not just shut it down altogether because of the litigation that you're creating possibilities for. That sounds uh, like great streamlining. Um, do, Mr. Chairman, do we have that uh, sheet that Mr. Delasky, uh, can we enter that into the record or maybe? Glad we'll to submit it for the record. This is our, our, our first draft and we will be working to, to, to finalize You'll it. You'll send us something. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, in my opinion, these 17 steps in the rulemaking process, including the six public comment periods, are going to add years of delay, you said twice, and in some cases may block a standard from being implemented at all, which is what you said. Uh, you know, and again, I'm all for transparency, but this seems to me like delay masquerading as transparency, in all honesty. Now, in Assistant Secretary Simmons' testimony, he stated that DOE has issued seven final rules since President Trump took office. I was going to ask Ms. Kennedy, can you comment on this number? Does this represent work completed during the Trump administration, or was some of this work completed by the Obama Department of Energy? It does not represent uh, work undertaken by this administration. Uh, I will check on this and get back to you, but I believe that five of those standards, uh, which the Assistant Secretary referred to, were issued under the Obama administration, and two were uh, congressional uh, standards, which merely needed to be posted. But I will check on that and get back to you. Uh, Mr. Simmons acknowledged uh, that there are 16 overdue standards uh, that this administration hasn't issued and also referred to the four Obama era efficiency standards, which made it all the way through under that administration, but have not been published in the, in the federal register. So all right, and then Mr. Thank you. Mr. Delasky, I'd like you to um, 
if you have anything to add to Ms. Kennedy's comments on that. But then I also wanted to ask you, I understand that appliance standards are saving people a lot of money and helping cut climate change emissions, but you also mentioned in your statement that they can help with resiliency, reliability, and affordability. So if you want to add to what Ms. Kennedy said, and then if you could uh, give me a, explain a bit more about what you said on resiliency, reliability, and affordability. Yeah, I'd be glad to do so. And, and just to follow up on, on Ms. Kennedy's comments, None of those seven standards were, represent substantive work by the current Department of Energy Administration. They have not issued a single proposal for a new standard or a single proposal for a final standard um, that is the result of work completed under this administration. All right, thanks. Um, the, um, with, with respect to your, your, your second question, resiliency, um, it is often an overlooked benefit that we get from improving efficiency of all the, of our products. You know, on the sweltering summer day, when the electricity grid is struggling to keep up with the demand of people's air conditioners, it matters enormously how energy efficient those air conditioners are. By keeping down the demand levels, the electric grid has to match up. Demand and supply have to match up. And as the, dem as the demand goes through the roof, if supply doesn't keep up, this leads to outages. Same thing on the heating side. When the polar vortex hits, you know, the furnaces, the efficiency of furnaces in our homes affects the ability of the natural gas supply system to keep up. If the system can't keep up, if the pressure can't be kept up, then people suffer. So by keeping efficiency in place, we're building resiliency into the electric supply and the ga gas supply system that ultimately helps consumers to stay warm or to stay cool and to be safe. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Chairman. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Griffin for five minutes. So here's the dilemma we have. I think we all want things to be more energy efficient, but we want products when we go to buy them to actually do what they're supposed to do and, and what they're purported to do and not have to spend three times or double the cost to get our dishwasher working, to get our clothes washer working, to have our refrigerators working. I mean, that's the dilemma, and, and it's good that we're having this hearing, Mr. Chairman, so that we can try to sort these things out. But I did find it with interest. I had this thing that my constituent sent me, and it's a little old, about the uh, washing machines that I mentioned in the previous hearing and mentioned a couple of times over the years because I had a constituent that was all fired up about it. And I noticed in there that it, that, and it is a little old, so I understand that. Things may have gotten better. But in 2007, according to this piece out of the Wall Street Journal, after the more stringent rules kicked in, consumer reports noted that some top loaders were leaving washing machines we're talking about, we're leaving its test swatches nearly as dirty as they were before washing. For the first time in years, Consumer Reports said we can't call any washer a best buy. In 2007, again, I'm, I'm acknowledging it's a little old, so I'm not saying it's something we should take to heart today, but it shows the point that consumers are having the problem with. 2007, only one conventional top loader was rated very good. Front loaders did better as did a new type of high efficiency top loader that lacks a central agitator. But even though these newer types of washers cost about twice as much as conventional top loaders, overall they didn't clean as well as the 1996 models. My dishwasher is newer now than it was three years ago. Got a new dishwasher. I find, as, as you, Mr. Guire, McGuire, pointed out, and, and even though that reg didn't come in, I'm doing a whole lot more washing of the dishes before I stick them in the dishwasher. And I actually mentioned to my wife, maybe we should just not have one if they're not gonna clean the dishes. And she said, yeah, but the temperature gets hotter in the dishwasher and that helps to um, sanitize them. But I'm, when I'm at home, I'm washing those dishes and I'm cleaning everything off of them because I don't trust the dishwasher. I'm not gonna pull that dish, that dish out of the dishwasher and serve it to somebody with specks of stuff on it. Mr. McGuire, isn't that the problem that you've been trying to highlight even though my dishwasher may not be the cause of the latest regs, but isn't that what consumers are finding out there? It, it's a very important feature of the, the balancing test that Congress enacted into EPCA and DOE has to deal with. Significant energy savings, economic payback, and, and don't wreck the product. It's gotta deliver performance and our industry is in everyone's home every day. Our products have to be trusted. And so in the case of the dishwasher I mentioned, uh, fortunately that was pulled back by DOE. But in, in some of these home appliances, 
like, like clothes washers or cooking products, there, there are diminishing returns that, that make the, the payback uh, questionable. We're not here arguing about whether there should be efficiency standards. We all agree on that. We're talking about how you do it and how you prioritize with limited resources. So we believe that today's dishwashers that meet today's standards perform very well. And uh, um, I'm sorry to, sorry to hear about your neighbor's well, I don't think, clothes washer. Yeah, and I don't, think, I don't think my dishwasher that I have now works as well as the one that was 15 or 20 years old before. But um, that's, it should. that's just it anecdotal. It uses less water, but it should, it should operate just as well. Yeah. Right. And then you wanted to talk about... As a representative about, of you, Consumer Reports, um, could I just respond to that really quickly? Well, sure. Do you have an update for me? Can you send me that data? Just send it to me because my time's running out. Happy to send it to you. We put out a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal because they misrepresented our data. So okay. that, that's an inaccurate All right. reference. Well, that's fair. And I, and I appreciate you letting me know that because I want accurate data. And, Happy to help. Um, you know, the problem is the consumer is feeling like they're getting less. They're spending more money on the product that they bought before, a lot more money, and they're not getting the, the product that they thought they were getting, and they feel like they're not getting as much. And I think we have to make sure we have that balance out there. Uh, refrigerators, you wanted to talk about that a little bit, Mr. McGuire? You had talked about the, effic the efficiency on refrigerators for not a whole lot of money, or for a whole lot of money more, not 5 or $6 savings. Well, yeah, I mean, if you were good, the today's refrigerator um, standard that's in effect and the Energy Star level above it, which is voluntary, but that Energy Star level is a more efficient product, and it's, it's only saving the consumer about $5 a year in, in electricity payments. So it, it just shows you that um, some of these incremental changes for products that have been regulated three and four times uh, are, are going to be harder to justify. Right. I appreciate that. My time's up. May I yield back? The chair now recognizes Mr. McKeachin for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to all of our witnesses, I would also say thank you for being here today. I want to just echo what I said earlier. Achieving greater energy efficiencies is incredibly important to the health of our planet and our communities. And pursuing these efficiencies will also put money back in the pockets of our constituents, including struggling families for whom every dollar, every extra dollar makes a difference. So I think our topic today is incredibly important, and I'm very glad that we're having this hearing. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, I'd like to echo the same question I asked Mr. Simmons earlier. Your testimony describes climate change as an existential threat. And you identify energy efficiency standards as a crucial tool in the struggle to minimize that change. So if energy efficiency standards are one tool in the climate toolkit, are we using that tool as, as effectively as current law permits? Does DOE decision-making on these standards fully reflect the true long-term climate costs of greater energy use? And if not, what would you like to see improved? Thank you for that great question. The consequences of, of the Department of Energy's delays on energy efficiency standards are really moving us backward on climate change. So just to, 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 put, uh, to put some specifics there, DOE's failure to issue the 16 overdue energy efficiency <laughs> standards that we've discussed puts at risk 70 million metric tons of carbon savings each year. That's more than the annual carbon emissions from energy use in all homes in New York City, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, and Philadelphia combined. So we're talking about some major backward progress on climate through DOE's inaction. We see the same thing through the lighting efficiency standards. The lighting provisions which were added in 2007 by Congress and signed into law by President Bush will have huge carbon savings. And by gutting the, energy, the definition of light bulbs uh, as DOE is proposing to do, in effect DOE is taking all, almost all of the energy efficiency savings out of that standard, a change that will cost consumers up to $12 billion on their utility bills and cause the use of up to 25 more power plants worth of electricity each year. So this program, um, when it is in place and being robustly implemented, 
is a big climate pollution saver and a big pollution saver overall. But right now, Americans aren't seeing those benefits from the efficiency standards program. We'd like to see DOE get back on track with its legal responsibilities to issue these standards. We'd like to see DOE abandon its efforts to uh, really gut the lighting efficiency standards, which uh, uh, Congress put into place. Uh, and while we're happy to talk about improvements to the process on issuing efficiency standards, the process rule uh, we're concerned is going to set us back lose valuable time, as Mr. Delasky has outlined, um, and again, is really putting us in reverse when we need to be all in on energy efficiency as a way of fighting climate and reducing uh, American energy bills. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Horrock, can you speak to how delays at DOE or laxity in terms of where standards are set adversely affect low-income families? Can we put a dollar figure on the savings that these families have missed out on as a result of the current administration's regulatory choices? Um, I, I don't think I can put precise dollar figures on it, um, although I can give you an estimate. So um, furnaces in particular, as I mentioned, are one of the biggest bills for people in states that are, have some level of serious heating load. Um, and an efficient furnace could cut your bill, particularly if you're replacing an old inefficient furnace. That is, when you bought it, it had a certain rating. Well, it's degraded since then. It can cut the bill 25%. I know with the low-income network that I work with and that actually installs these furnaces in low-income homes, you could easily be cutting that person's heating bill um, by 25%. And for a low-income person living in an inefficient house and an, with an inefficient furnace, that's hundreds of dollars a year that are being uh, lost out. So as I mentioned in my initial testimony or in response to the chairman's questions, we are at the National Consumer Law Center particularly interested in stronger furnace standards because it's incredibly important for low-income people. And any delay in that, the last time the rule was significantly revised is more than 25 years ago now. There was mo modest uh, change in the 1990s. Um, so it, delay really hurts low-income people on a very important uh, impact on their energy bills and, and, and their health and comfort when you're talking about furnaces. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Vesey for five minutes uh, for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harrick, uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about uh, renters. As you know, we've had a, a, ma a tremendous shift in our society. I'll tell you, you know, like personally, the, the neighborhood that my mother grew up in, the Lake Como community, because of segregation during that time period, there were people that of all economic backgrounds that lived in that community, doctors, lawyers, but also people that worked in people's homes and drove buses and did a lot of, uh, did a lot of different jobs. Um, they had, most of those families had two household incomes. They had two incomes inside of that house and they were homeowners. Uh, as you know, now many low income people uh, in this country can no longer afford to buy a home. They're no longer homeowners. Many, many of them no, no longer have the luxury of two incomes in and in a household and they find themselves more and more having to rent. Uh, I wanted to ask you what would be the stress put on low income households uh, if, if landlords, you know, don't, if we don't update this policy, making landlords update their appliances and things like that, and, and what impact can that have on the bottom line of low-income household families? Do you mind if I just ask where your district is? I've lived in Texas, so I am curious. In Fort Worth, Texas. My uh, uh, mom grew up in a little community in Fort Worth, Texas called the Lake Como community. I, I've lived in Fort Worth, so I was curious. Um, so let me say that when the department was considering central air conditioning standards, I made sure to speak to people at Texas Rose, ratepayers' organization to save energy in, in Texas, to get a sense of you know, how do, how do low-income people come into homes where there are these appliances? Well, one, they're renters, and as I mentioned in my testimony, renters will lose out if we don't have good standards because the owner is going to buy that appliance and the owner is often going to go get the lower cost appliance. It makes perfect economic sense. 
But then I also spoke to folks, well, how do, how do people wind up in homes even as homeowners, let's say, with central air conditioning? Well, they're usually buying an older home. And so someone else probably installed that appliance uh, so that you know, a low-income person buying a modest home in Fort Worth is probably not going to install new central air conditioning. And so we need the standards because the homes that are now on the kind of secondary market, um, that appliance was installed by someone else. We want to have good standards because low-income people are buying that home after the central systems have already been put in the home. So I think both low-income renters but even low-income homeowners benefit from, from strong standards around these appliances that are the major portion of their bills. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. No, that, that was actually very helpful. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Friedman, would you agree that the DOE has a clear set of tools in its toolbox to help low-income renters? Um, I do think DOE has uh, many tools to help uh, low-income residents, but uh, let's be honest, with, with more resources, I think DOE could do more. Uh, the weatherization program uh, has an amazing history of helping folks, and uh, during ARA was able to really ramp up and help even more, but at this point, the funding is much lower than it was uh, during uh, the Recovery Act. So that's certainly one place where I think uh, with more resources, DOE could do more. I would also just add that, you know, ensuring that every dollar spent at DOE that's supposed to be focused on efficiency and getting appliance standards out is going to help everyone and especially low-income homeowners who spend as a share of their income three times as much on heating, electricity, water, et cetera, than your average American. So low-income Americans tend to stand to gain even more than most Americans uh, from these standards. Thank you very much. Mr. Hark, do you have any? I do think Mr. Friedman raises an incredibly important point. I'm meeting with my congresswoman, uh, Catherine Clark, I hope in about 30 minutes to talk to her about the need for increased funding for the Weatherization Assistant Program. If you want to talk about a program that makes a gigantic difference in the lives of low-income people, it is the Weatherization Assistance Program. As I mentioned in response to your first question, when the network I work with in Massachusetts goes to a low-income home, the low side savings are 20% in their energy bills. And if that house was really poorly insulated and had an old heating system, sometimes we're saving 40% in the household we touch it. So it's very important we get to more of those households, and that means we need a lot more money in the Weatherization Assistance Program, which is, of course, part of DOE. I appreciate the question. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman, the chair and I recognize uh, Mr. O'Halloran from Arizona for five minutes for the purposes of questioning the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to commend each of the witnesses in their second panel today for contributing thoughtful insight into this important conversation about energy efficiency standards. I believe we can all agree that meaningful efficiency standards are important not only for the marketplace, but for consumers and the environment as well. Uh, Mr. Delasky, uh, in your testimony, you cite a recent economic study which estimates that savings from energy efficiency standards resulted in 300,000 more jobs in the United States economy in 2016 uh, than would have been the case absent any standards. In your review, how might a delay in issuing efficiency standards impact the availability of these related jobs, especially in rural communities? So the delay in the standards and updating standards is reducing the savings that consumers will get in the future. Um, the, the, what I'm what was described in that economic study is the, the secondary effect is that as people save money on their bills, um, they're spending less money on gas and electricity and water and sewer bills, and that puts money back in their pocket they spend on other goods and services. So the delays mean that there's you know, 60-some billion dollars in savings that are going to be delayed, which means people have less money in their pocket to find other goods and services that helps to create jobs in local communities. So that's the cost. Um, Mr. Fried Friedman, uh, in your testimony, you highlight your concerns with the department's uh, proposal, proposed changes of their process rule. In your view, do you see any harmful uh, harms caused to the marketplace by the department setting a new definition for efficiency? 
Well, certainly the thresholds that they've created, I, I see significant harm. Um, I think, you know, in terms of uh, devices that people refer to as, as vampire loads, all those electronics that are now, we literally rely on throughout our daily lives. Uh, if the process rule in that threshold uh, blocks the ability of the agency to set those standards, uh, it's gonna set us all back. And right now, that equipment is about 40% of energy use. Uh, that's only gonna grow both as other appliances get more efficient and as we get more and more cool stuff. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, uh, I, I used to be a project manager and, a, and working on fairly complex projects on technology and buildings and uh, d development of designs of buildings in order to incorporate technology into them. Uh, I am at a loss, and maybe you can help me because you, you seem to be very concerned with the timeliness of things getting done here. Uh, I'm at a loss to understand how it takes so long within this department, and quite frankly, I've worked with the FCC and the CFTC and some others, um, to get things done in an efficient way, in a timely way, to make sure that we take advantage of changes in technology and other areas and make sure that we're, we as a government are efficient also in, make, in moving the projects forward and getting things done on time. Can you help me at all? I was struck by the fact that Assistant Secretary Simmons didn't point to any reason for the delays in, in the 16 overdue efficiency standards. He said that the department had sufficient resources, didn't point to any particular problem. Uh, and so that, that, that tells me that there's a problem, that there is a problem of will, uh, and, and that uh, we, we need to get that program back on track. There's nothing in regulation or statute that's causing those delays. It's something within the Department of Energy under this administration. And we've seen this program work well uh, over various different administrations over the years. Uh, of both political parties. So there, there is some issue around political will, possibly around ideology, which is holding things back. And that's really concerning uh, for, for consumers, for the environment, for jobs, and, and, and our ability to fight back on climate change. I do know the developers that I have worked for in the past would be very upset on cost overruns and not getting jobs in and done on time. So thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield. I want to thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Uh, I believe um, efficiency must be our first fuel of choice. According to the International Energy Agency's um, Energy Efficiency 2018 report, energy efficiency alone can account for more than 40% of the emissions uh, reductions needed to meet global targets set forth in the uh, Paris Agreement. So, Ms. Kennedy, what have you and NRDC found? How important is efficiency for achieving climate targets? Energy efficiency is absolutely crucial and fundamental to achieving our U.S. Uh, uh, climate targets, or what should be our U.S. climate targets. Uh, without energy efficiency, we can't get the job done. We need to also invest in renewables, electrify transportation and buildings, but energy efficiency is absolutely fundamental to fighting climate change and to doing it in an affordable way. NRDC issued a report last year called America's Clean Energy Frontier, the Pathway to a Safer Climate Future, and energy efficiency is going to deliver the largest amount of, of carbon savings that the U.S. can muster, so it's really important. Thank you. And would you say DOE's standards program plays a big role in our overall efficiency agenda? It plays, it, it plays a very crucial role, yes. And can you give us a sense of how important improvements in lighting, including the performance gains and cost reductions in LED technologies, have been to improve uh, building efficiency? Uh, the, the, uh, the innovation that we've seen in lighting, the improvement that we've seen in lighting efficiency spurred by, uh, by Congress's actions and by DOE's actions under the last administration have been uh, hugely important. And um, Ms. Kennedy again and Mr. Delasky and uh, Mr. Friedman, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Can you... 
explain the statutory backstop on tier two of lighting standards and as you do that, can you also respond to the response made to me about the backstop of, of the assistant secretary uh, and his rationale? Because I'm trying to figure out, you know, why that, what triggering the backstop is all about. Yes, the Department of Energy's current interpretation, which Assistant Secretary Simmons uh, discussed this morning, is incorrect in my view, and I've been uh, addressing these issues for, for decades, both through litigation and through rulemaking and other activities. ESA included, ESA directed the Department of Energy uh, to do a rulemaking by, July, by, by uh, 2017 to examine the scope of light bulbs uh, that would be included under the, uh, the new set of standards, and also to examine whether the standards in the backstop should be stronger. The Obama administration came up uh, with a rule through a long process that involved all sorts of stakeholder engagement, and the acting within the authority which ESA provided it determined that the, that the, uh, the scope of general service uh, uh, lamps should be expanded in various ways to include uh, a, a number of, of additional bulbs. The Department of Energy is now trying to undo that, <coughs> and it faces a very high burden as it, as it does that, because as you know, once a federal agency has gone through a long rulemaking, made a determination, uh, there, there, there's no finding, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no challenge striking down that determination, it is very, very uh, hard to undo it and reach a different result. The backstop absolutely has been triggered. Congress in ESA uh, um, included this backstop provision so that if the Department of Energy didn't do its job, that backstop would be in place as of January 1st, 2020. So that backstop is there. Uh, I believe it's enforceable. And what the Department of Energy is doing is creating all sorts of uncertainty for manufacturers Jeez. and for consumers. And I'll also just mention those standards, the backstop standards, have been in place in California since 2018. And it's been a smooth transition, uh, no problems, tons of bulbs on the market that, that meet those standards. Thank you. Mr. Delasky and Mr. Friedman, I have just a little bit of time left, but if each of you could just speak to the comments made by the Assistant Secretary about the uh, backstop. I just will echo what, what Ms. Kennedy said, which is that the Assistant Secretary is wrong. The backstop has been triggered, um, and the light bulb standards need to take effect next year. That's what the law requires, um, and um, the failure to do so is an uh, abnegation of the department's uh, legal obligations. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I could be wrong, but I am pretty sure my signature is on, this, uh, on that rule that came out under the Obama administration. Uh, our general counsel was very clear on the law. The secretary supported the general counsel, and we issued a, uh, a change in the definition. So I think the law is pretty clear, and I think, sadly, it, this may end up being the courts that have to uh, reinforce what Congress said. Again, uh, statute is not arbitrary. Statute is not optional. Uh, it needs to be followed. And resolving it in the courts will only provide for more uncertainty. So uh, I thank you all for your responses. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. <laughs> Gentlemen, yields back. The, uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, th thank you very much, and thank the panel. Uh, Mr. Delasky, Vermont enacted a couple of state-level standards, appliance standards, in the past two years, one for light bulbs and another that covers 18, 18 products. And can you explain the relative role of states and the federal government in appliance standards? Uh, yes, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the fundamental elements of the federal law we haven't talked a lot about today is the federal standards are generally preemptive. Once the federal standards are in place, states are preempted from acting. But one of the fundamental elements of the federal, of the federal legislation is that in, in preempting the states, do you, the Congress put on DOE the obligation to keep standards up to date, do the reviews we've been talking about. That's the deal. Right. So. When that's not happening, you're seeing more states, like leaders like Vermont, and there's another 13 states that are considering similar legislation currently, following in Vermont's leadership, leading, leading footsteps. Um, you're seeing more states step in. Now, they can't address things that are preempted, but they're looking at other products. Right. 
um, and they're also adopting the light bulb standards so because let me, they're concerned. Let me just, yeah, let me go on on that. So one of the laws that we did pass in Vermont was designed to protect against the federal rollback of the light bulb standards, uh, and it essentially copied the federal light bulb standard in a state law. And now that the, the DEA has announced that they intend to rescind the broadened scope of the light bulb standards, what does that mean to states like Vermont and others that have essentially uh, copied the federal standard? So Vermont, like California, will now be in a position to enforce standards instead of the federal, instead of the federal government. So what we're going to see is a state-by-state -state approach um, in addition to insisting that the federal standard also is in place. So the uncertainty that was referenced earlier, it's being multiplied over and over again. Right. Thank um, you. Instead of having a situation where we knew what was going to happen, Congress set the, set the bar 13 years ago, now we have uncertainty um, right. that's creating lots of, lots of problems. Thank I think. you. No. Thank you. Mr. Yurak, uh, how, does, how does the uncertainty that was just mentioned introduced by the DOE failure to meet their deadlines affect your member companies. And you mentioned in your testimony that the feast or famine is not a helpful way for DOA to run the program. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that? And by the way, my whole understanding is that a lot of the manufacturers uh, in the private sector, they can live with standards. They just want to know what they are. And then the competition is about who can do the best product compliant with those standards. Uh, that is very correct, uh, Congressman. Um, my members don't manufacture light bulbs, so I'm not going to go down that path. Um, but we do cherish and want certainty and predictability. And we, want to, we need that to plan and make the investments in our products, in our production lines, in the, in the distribution of those products. And so when there is a schedule, we want that schedule to be met so that we can meet those. But we also want uh, good rules that make sense. And it also goes to those, the different consumers um, that were talked about earlier in their ability to afford. And we want to make sure that they're economically justified so all consumers, be they low income as well as those that can afford the uh, higher cost, can afford the equipment to get the comfort that they need. So it's balancing that and doing it in a, a, a full, using the full time frame for developing the rule versus short circuiting it and then coming up with rules that might not be the best. Okay, Ms. Kennedy, you know, uh, actually, I'm following up on that question, one of the debates we have here, I was on the er earlier uh, uh, panel where my friend from Virginia raised questions about the affordability of standards. Uh, and that, by the way, is a concern I have. Uh, and we're always wrestling with whether this, the standard overdoes it by making a product more expensive than you can afford, and then you lose the savings because the product isn't going to be deployed. So one of the challenges I have is there'll always be a difference of opinion about where's the right place to land, but we probably agree, Morgan, that using less energy is better than using more. Is there some mechanism by which there can be some flexibility and quick response to negative reaction in the marketplace uh, because the standard just overreaches a bit. Well, there is some flexibility in the in the in the procedures and the statute. Manufacturers have the have the ability to petition DOE uh, for an exemption or waiver from a particular standard. When Could we get a turnaround on that a lot a little quicker? Because I'm actually sympathetic to that. I had a door and window window manufacturer, and they were totally committed to standards, totally committed to efficiency. But they actually were having a problem with the compliance challenges for a standard that was set to the point where people weren't going to be able to afford to buy that product. And if we can get an answer on that, then we take some of the fight out because the overreaction we have from f some folks who are legitimately are concerned about their lower income consumers uh, is to say, look, we don't want any standards because it's going to price them out. And I, M Mr. Griffin, I don't want that. I, I really want standards. Uh, but it, 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 do you have some suggestions on how we could get a quicker turnaround so there'd be some confidence? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all the witnesses for uh, your participation. I know there's been 
time consuming and we certainly value your time and we certainly appreciate all your efforts and all your testimony here this morning. I want to thank you very much. Um, and the witnesses are uh, dismissed right now. Thank you once, once again. Uh, the, the chair requests unanimous consent to enter uh, into the records uh, documents and that have been previously agreed to by the um, ranking member of the subcommittee and without objection, so ordered. I, I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, uh, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be addressed, to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such question that you may receive. At this time, the subcommittee stands adjourned. All right, Bobby. All right. Thank you, sir. All right.